Hope. Chapter 1 Golden sunlight filtered in through the coloured glass of the picture window, bathing those sitting under it in a kaleidoscope of colours. Robert Banfield, the vicar's only son, found his eye wandering from the pulpit to this dazzling display. As the vicar's son, he was meant to be sitting front and centre, in one of the stalls among the toniest of the ton. Well, as much as the sleepy village of Shropsborough could boast of such people, Robert, however, found that he preferred sitting high in the balcony. This was ostensibly where the overflow was supposed to sit, or those that did not have regular seats in the congregation. In reality, it was always empty, save for the occasional migrant shepherd who was working his way through the countryside. Robert did not mind their company, as they understood the value of silence. This self-imposed solitude also had the benefit of allowing him to sketch as he pleased. He could not have asked for a more rich cast of characters. There was the baker, his waistcoat straining against his round belly. The butcher, a disarmingly diminutive man, his wife comporting herself as if she were a duchess in fine Parisian silk instead of humble calico. The farmers, their endless flocks of children, the cobbler, the ostler. All had found their way into Robert's folio. It would have been easy for him to turn them into humorous caricatures, an exaggerated nose here, an elongated neck there, but Robert had treated them with dignity. At the end of his pencil, this mishmash of humanity had found a quiet, simple beauty. The vicar did not approve of him spending so much time on his drawings these days, but even he was inclined to grudgingly admit that Robert had found the best in their neighbours. Of course, there was one face that found itself into the pages of Robert's folio more than all the others. It was a soft, delicate, feminine visage, with a heart-shaped face and large, kind eyes. By habit, Robert's eyes flicked to the subject in question and found her sitting amidst her parents and younger siblings. A sigh, light and automatic, escaped Robert's lips as he saw her. The truth was that he had been in love with Hope Wycliffe, for as long as he could remember. The sun shifted a little, the clouds parting, and golden, beatific light shafted in through the plain leaded glass windows along the westerly wall of the church. As it would happen, this seemingly divine light had the good fortune of falling across hope. Her pale pink skin was illuminated shining like polished ivory, her striking black hair done up in ribbons set to shining like obsidian. The White Cliffs were the closest thing that Shropsborough could claim to actual ton. They were an old family, very proud and very wealthy. Though this particular branch did not boast any titles, they were given the due respect of a moneyed family of good name and standing. Mr Samuel Wycliffe owned nearly the entirety of the village proper, and much of countryside. He had a reputation as a firm but exceedingly fair landlord, and his tenants were treated to seasonal feasts, with as much cider as they could stomach. Robert was a man transfixed. He leaned forward, resting his chin on his folded arms on the polished wooden railing that encircled the balcony. His folio was forgotten, balancing precariously on his lap. At the front of the church, the vicar droned on, his rich voice echoing about the chapel. Robert was very well aware that he should be playing the part of a dutiful son, at least pretending to be paying his father's sermon some mind. He found he couldn't, unable to tear his eyes away from the scene of perfect beauty before him. When her perfectly formed, rose-pink lips moved to murmur along with the hymn, he could not help but sigh again. Though his father could not afford to send him on the grand tour across Europe, and was unlikely to have done so anyway with the trouble in France, Robert had been invited to the Wycliffe home with regularity. The library there boasted a seemingly endless amount of books from every corner of the world, including some that had engraved copies of some of the paintings of the Italian and Dutch old masters. Though he had never been bold enough to voice opinion aloud, 
Robert was of the firm belief that if da Vinci or Rubens could have seen Hope's face, they surely would have chosen her to represent the Virgin Mary in their rich portraits. Robert was thoroughly lost in thought, sighing dreamily at the girl whom he could never dare to hope to marry. It was therefore something of a rude shock when his folio chose the precise moment when the vicar had fallen silent to fall to the floor with a loud slap that echoed throughout the chapel. Robert froze, not even daring to breathe. The vicar did not say anything, nor did he stir from his current posture of grasping the pulpit firmly. He merely glared up in the direction of the balcony from beneath his dark, bushy brows. Robert could feel himself blushing all the way down to his neck, particularly as some of the congregation twisted their necks about to glare at him in turn. His eyes were pulled back to hope, as if there was a magnetic force between them. Hope did not turn about, but kept her eyes facing forward. She wore a wide straw hat, tied beneath her chin with ribbons, so that much of her face was obscured. At first, Robert thought that the subtle movement of her shoulders was her wincing. On closer inspection, however, he could just make out the round shape of her cheeks lifting in a smile. She was, in fact, doing her best not to laugh. When at last the vicar began speaking again, Hope turned ever so slightly, and spotting Robert, sent him the briefest but most dazzling of grins. If he were a man of poetry, he might have found words of sufficient beauty, of more eloquence to describe the moment. As it was, he could only imagine an impish Cupid firing an arrow of such fire directly into his heart. After the services were concluded, it was expected that Robert would take his place next to his father outside the church doors. Here, the vicar and his dutiful son would present the picture of perfect patriarchal devotion. Robert was expected to remain silent and less addressed, nodding sympathetically only when called upon to do so. It was growing more and more difficult for Robert to keep up this lip service, particularly as it was such a lovely spring morning. So Robert simply crept down the back stairs from his perch in the balcony and slipped out through the heavy wooden side door. The iron fixtures on the door, forged in centuries long gone, rattled a little as he did so. Robert froze and held his breath, swivelling his head this way and that to see if he would be caught. There was no one about to espy him, however, so he tucked his folio under his arm and set off across the open field that abutted the church. The ground rose slowly under him, all the way up to a lone tree on a gentle hill. This was his customary station, not a hiding place exactly, but separate and apart from the world. From up here, he could see the church and the humble but warm rectory behind it. In the distance, the village of Shropsborough was nestled between two other hills, held snug and secure. Farms spread out like a patchwork quilt, separated by hedgerows and stone walls that had existed since time immemorial. On the side of the hill that faced the rectory, his father's grey cow with floppy ears grazed slowly, barely even bothering to look up at Robert as he passed by. Once Robert had reached the crest of the hill, he blew out a heavy sigh flopping backward a little to lean his back against the rough trunk of the tree. I expected you would retreat up here once the coast was clear, a voice said lightly from very near his shoulder. Robert started, dropping his folio in the process. He whirled about and from behind the tree stepped Hope. She was dressed in the height of fashion, a spring polonaise of sprigged muslin and a wide green ribbon about her waist. A matching ribbon held her large straw hat to her head, folding the sides in slightly to frame her face. The polonaise was drawn up in fashionable poofs, revealing delicate ankles well turned out in stockings and buckled shoes. Hope was widely considered a leader of fashion in the county, and she had initially shocked the matrons by eschewing the panniers of their youth. In her hand was a simple posy of spring buds that she had collected, no doubt on her way up the hill. She was, in short, a vision of spring. Robert was dimly aware that he was staring at her in a manner that was probably not altogether polite. 
Hope didn't seem to notice, however, turning to stare back at the small village. She raised her hand, fingers and thumb forming an L. It seems strange that I should be able to fit my whole life into the palm of my hand, she mused. Robert had nothing to say to that, mostly because he was staring at her profile, the way the sunlight illuminated her cheeks and the tip of her nose, the tilt of her hat. But it was not simply hope. It was the perfection of the moment. The sky was pure blue with fluffy white clouds scattered about like errant sheep. All about them the landscape was springing to life, flowers blooming, ewes heavy with lamb. Nearby there was the unmistakable hum of a beehive. Robert wished most fervently for a way to capture this moment, wishing that he could live inside it forever. I suppose your father will be in a tizzy about your interruption, Hope said, turning back around and nodding at Robert's folio. Yes, I imagine he will be, Robert said, with a quiet smile. Are things still difficult between you? Hope asked gently, stepping a little closer. Robert gave a non-committal shrug with one shoulder. He thinks that I lack direction, I think he lacks conviction. I am not sure there is a solution. My father says that you are one of the best read young men of the county, Hope offered, which only set Robert to blushing again. Surely you could enter university if you wished, matriculate? Robert sighed, leaning his back against the tree again. But to what end? What good can I do with such an education? Hope studied Robert, her round blue eyes searching. You wish to help your fellow man then, like the French philosophers say? Yes, Robert replied. Though he spoke quietly, there was a great deal of conviction in his voice. Hope appeared to consider this. She put her left hand on the trunk of the tree and leaned out, pulling herself in a tilted circle about the tree. I must confess that I did not fully understand it when you read Kant and Rousseau to me, she said from behind the tree, her voice muffled. Robert smiled a little. Perhaps the point is simply that you listened, he said. You believe that my desire to be good is worthy of praise, then, she called a light, teasing air to her voice. I do. Robert said, much more seriously. There are precious few even willing to hear the new ideas. Like your father, Hope asked, her voice quieter. Robert tilted his head back, letting his eyes study the budding canopy of leaves above him. Like my father, he agreed softly. A silence, full of contemplation, passed between them then. There was a slight rustling as Hope continued her journey around the tree, her weight carrying her in a circle. We used to do this as children, do you remember? I do, Robert said. Standing, he mimicked her posture, following about the tree in her footsteps. You used to say that it felt like flying. It felt that way, up on this hill. Hope laughed. I used to believe many things back then. She continued, her steps slowing. Robert occasionally caught glimpses of her face as she turned about the tree. He could see her expression falling, becoming more sombre. Such is the great hope of childhood, I suppose, Robert said, merely because he felt that he had to say something. Once they had been the closest of childhood friends. More and more, however, Robert had the strangest sensation, as if they were having two separate conversations. Moreover, there was an invisible wall between them, like a pane of glass. I used to believe that a dashing young man would fall so desperately in love with me that he would declare his love and sweep me from my feet, Hope continued, her voice sounding strange and strangled. At some point she had reversed direction and now had swung around the tree to face Robert directly. There was no escaping the direct stare of her light blue-grey eyes, which bored directly into Robert's. He blinked at her, owl-like, unsure, 
of what to say to that. His heart raced, his palms were sweating. What could he say? Confronted with such a beauty, such a tender heart. The silence stretched, becoming unbearable. Robert searched frantically for a response that wouldn't be untoward or above his station. Though his father was a respected pillar of the community, he was still only the son of a country vicar, and Hope was... she was everything. Though she did not break eye contact, the tone of her gaze changed. Her eyes went a little glassy, as if suddenly dewy with tears which was both distressing and confusing to Robert. His panic only grew. Abruptly, Hope straightened, comporting herself in the manner of a great lady. Her back was straight, her chin parallel to the ground, her expression one of distant disinterest. As you say, these were clearly the fancies of childhood, she said smoothly. Still, she remained standing close to Robert, which only made his heart race more. Helpless, hapless, he stared into her eyes, unable to break the spell he was under. If only my traitor of a tongue were able to tell her all that was in my heart, I might, we might, he thought desperately. Miss Wycliffe, a voice called. Hope blinked once, twice, the moment between them broken. She turned her head about, her gaze landing on a figure that was halfway up the hill. Thus released, Robert too looked down the hill and spotted the white-capped head of a maid. The poor servant had stopped halfway up the hill and was waving her kerchief, clearly not wishing to climb the rest of the way up. It would appear that Mamma has sent a maid to fetch me, Hope said. I must make my farewells. Her voice was clipped and precise, and Robert nearly winced with each syllable. Yes, Robert agreed, feeling that the only safe response was to agree with her. That strange wall was back in place, and he did not know in truth what Hope was referring to. He knew only that he wished to please her. You should go, or... or you will be missed, he offered. Hope had already started down the hill by a few steps, and turned back to stare for a moment at him. She arched one of her brows imperiously, as if silently asking him, Will I be missed? With the quickest of curtsies, she was gone, floating back down the hill. Chapter Two If it had been possible, Hope would have liked to have lingered under the tree outside the rectory, their tree, until nightfall. As it was, her maid was busily hustling her to the open lando pulled by two champagne-coloured horses that was parked outside the church. Her mother and father were always besieged after Sunday church service, and Hope had known that she could slip away without being noticed. She hadn't realised how long she had tarried, however, until she saw that the Lando was already packed with her siblings, her mother seated with the youngest Wycliffe on her lap. The floor of the carriage could not be seen for all the petticoats and white muslin. Her father was still in conversation with the vicar, both of them pulling serious faces. Hope, dear, there you are, her mother called from the carriage. At last, she said pointedly, and there was some vinegar in her voice. Her mother did not like these long, lingering conversations that Mr Wycliffe was prone to engaging in with the vicar. She would much rather be at home, her feet on her favourite poof, tea and dainty sandwiches on a tray next to her, a cold cloth across her eyes. Forgive me, mother, Hope sighed without much real feeling. She paused, surveying the small round faces of her siblings staring back at her. They could not help but bring a grin to her face. Her fists planted on her hips. She affected irritation. Well, where is your big sister to sit then? Shall I have to cling on to the back or simply run alongside? A chorus of mischievous giggles met that. Just throw your leg over Minnie and ride her like you do at home, Justine piped up. Hope widened her eyes and pressed her lips into a thin line at the ten-year-old, shooting a glance to her mother at the same time. Thankfully, Mrs Wycliffe was busy rubbing her temples and trying to keep baby William from toppling from her lap to take much note. There was strict protocol for the acceptable manner in which young ladies could ride. 
but Hope disdained the side saddle. She simply waited until her parents were busy and would go tearing off the countryside astride as she had done when she was a girl. Justine, suitably cowed, sheepishly shrank back and made a place for her big sister. Hope gave her a sidelong glance, doing her most not to grin back. It was impossible to sit in such a manner that one's dress would not become crushed, but Hope did not mind. She loved beautiful dresses. She loved her siblings more. Hope, would you please help manage them? I cannot countenance the governess vanishing like this, Mrs Wycliffe sighed wearily. Hope, hiding a smile, ducked her head and did her best to entertain the gaggle of noisy children. Ostensibly, the governess was free to attend church services with the other servants and not expected to mind the children. In reality, Hope knew that she was sneaking off to make time with one of the farmer's sons. Hope had caught them walking down a country lane, holding hands of all things. Ever since, there had been an uneasy truce between herself and the governess. Mr Wycliffe, do come along, dear. We don't want to be late for our pressing appointment, Mrs Wycliffe called out pointedly, a smile plastered on her face for the vicar. Lovely service, Reverend, as always, she said with a dismissive wave of her gloved hand. With a final parting of grave nods and shaking hands, Mr Wycliffe at last made his way to the carriage. Hope, I am glad to see you have found your way back to us, he remarked coolly. With one hand he settled his tricorn hat back atop his head, and with his other he reached for the bridle of his riding horse, Gunpowder. Hope said nothing, merely eyed her father's position enviously. He always rode alongside the carriage, sighting his bad back not tolerating the jolting of the country roads. Hope firmly suspected that it was really more that he didn't wish to be packed in with his six children still living at home. Hope was possessed of two other brothers, both of whom were off at school. Hope didn't mind, however. Her whole life had been spent among the happy noises and chaos of children. She had real affection for them, even when they were being less than angelic. So it was that she was able to tune them out easily enough, allowing her mind to wander as the pastoral landscape passed slowly by. Hope! Her mother's sharp voice broke in. Are you paying mind? I'm sorry, mother, I was... Hope began and trailed off, for she did not really have an excuse. Her conversation with Robert had put her in a melancholy state of mind, when we return home, you must let the governess and nurse settle the children. We cannot have you looking any more. Mrs Wycliffe paused here, running a critical eye over her eldest daughter. Dishevelled, she said with a sigh of disappointment. Why, in particular? Hope asked, her eyes sharp on her mother. Mrs Wycliffe made a great show of tending to baby William, ignoring Hope. This does not bode well, Hope grimaced to herself, and it did not in fact bode well. Hope, her dress and hair refreshed as much as was possible, was now perched on a sofa between her mother and the armrest. Across from her, her father stood, one arm resting on the mantelpiece, surveying the scene before him. In an armchair to Hope's right sat the Right Honourable Matthew Featherstone, Lord Tilney. He was an acquaintance of her father and had paid calls before. It was unusual, however, for him to spend any of his valuable time taking tea with the ladies of the house. Lord Tilney had made it abundantly clear that he found the company of the fairer sex tedious, and both Hope and her mother had found this suited them as well. He was not a bad man, at least according to her father's reports. In fact, he had made it a point to stress that his income was quite generous and his estate was large and grand, larger perhaps even than his own. Though Lord Tilney was a man of advanced years, he was not yet enfeebled, nor ungenerous. He had said all of this very, very pointedly, looking directly into Hope's eyes. Hope, for her part, had simply stared back blankly. Mr Wycliffe had clearly taken this as some sort of acquiescence, for he nodded in approval and had withdrawn to welcome Lord Tilney. So now Hope found herself seated quite near a man, 
who was little better than a stranger, watching him brush crumbs from his waistcoat. It was better than the alternative, which was to stare at the prodigious amount of hair growing from his ears. Hope had half a mind to summon the gardener with his bill hooks and see if he couldn't put this hedge in order too. Compounding the picture was the fact that Lord Tilney still wore a powdered wig, which was acceptable, but it was styled in a long queue and a row of buckles or rolls of hair across the temples and crown. It was impossible for Hope to listen to anything that came out of his mouth, for his words were punctuated by a cascade of crumbs. Worse, he was in the habit of conveying all expressions by means of his brow, which rose and fell vehemently with each sentence. This caused the wig to shift and roll like a ship at sea. Therefore, Hope found herself murmuring quiet agreements, as was expected of a young lady, every time he turned a question to her. This seemed an acceptable strategy, for Lord Tilney nodded and puffed his chest whenever she agreed with him. Unfortunately, this seemed to work a little too well. Lord Tilney, having devoured two entire slices of cake, the evidence of which was still scattered on his waistcoat, seized Hope's hand as she was reaching for the teapot. Your girl is every bit as charming and agreeable as you said she was, he announced loudly, as if the assembled were suddenly hard of hearing. Hope stared, a strange prickling as before a summer storm crawling up her neck. You may have your lawyers begin drawing up the contract. Contract, Hope repeated. Lord Tilney turned a condescending eye on Hope. Ah, the gentler sex. Bless you, you've not a clue as to the business of marriage. No, it's all dresses and veils for you, eh? Lord Tilney has done you the great honour of making an offer, Mrs Wycliffe said, and Hope did not even have to turn about to know that a forced smile was pasted across her face. Nevertheless, she whirled about, facing her mother with an expression that she would not care to have seen in the looking-glass. He has made an offer, Hope repeated slowly. Ah, bless her, bless her, Lord Tilney chortled. She can scarce believe it, such a good modest girl. Yes, Mr Whitecliffe said with a credibly serious face. We have always believed so. Now I would not wish to detain you further, he said and began the delicate art of hustling Lord Tilney from the drawing-room. Before this was accomplished, however, Lord Tilney reached out and gently pinched one of Hope's cheeks with a butter-slicked finger. No doubt he thought this the height of affection, and imagined Hope suitably wooed. In reality her stomach did a flip of revulsion. It was a testament to her good nature that she remained composed and suitably demure until he had finally quitted the drawing-room. It was not until his booming voice was moving down the hall that hope finally broke. Oh, Mama, you cannot be serious, she cried. Why ever not, Mrs Wycliffe demanded. You will have security, safety, a good position. Lord Tilney has connections in the government and at court. Think of your brothers, if nothing else. This marriage could help to secure them good positions. And your sisters? Mrs Wycliffe gestured grandly here, her white ruffled cap somewhat underscoring her. Just think of the gentleman you could introduce them to in turn. Ah, Hope said icily, I see. I am to be sacrificed so that the others may have a chance of happiness. Only a fool would be unhappy with this arrangement, Mrs Wycliffe said pointedly. Then I must be a fool, Hope said, rising and sweeping from the drawing room. Though she could hear her mother calling after her, Hope ignored her in a great show of defiance. Chapter 3 It was a couple hours later when her father finally found her. Hope had taken off across the back gardens with a swift and determined pace that belied her penchant for long, rambling walks across the countryside. There was a great oak at the back of the property, quite near a stone wall where her grandfather had hung a simple wooden swing for his own children. 
Hope was quite fond of this spot, for a parcel of raspberries grew thickly just over the wall and a creek flowed nearby. If she chose, she could stay all day out here, sticking her bare feet in the cool water and eating as many raspberries as she liked. Today, however, she merely sat upon the swing, slowly pushing herself back and forth with the toes of one foot. She had eschewed her kid leather shoes with the bright gold buckles and fine silk stockings. Her head was bent, her gaze fixed upon the grass and dirt beneath her. It was impossible to miss the approaching footsteps, but she did not bother to look up. Besides, she would have known her father's gait anywhere, particularly as he had a habit of stopping some feet away from her and looking out across the fields. This is a fine spot, he remarked casually. Hope remained silent, nodding minutely. I used to retreat here to hide from your grandfather too. I'm not hiding from you, Hope protested quietly. No. Oh, father, how could you? She said quietly, looking up finally. Ah, he said, nodding in understanding. Yes, I rather anticipated you would be upset by this news. He turned and settled himself precariously on the crumbling stone wall. Then why did you agree to my marrying him? Mr. Wycliffe sighed. My dear girl, I have eight children to think of. I cannot tell you the ease with which it settles my mind to see you married so well. Lord Tilney has agreed to be most generous. You shall have your own settlement and a grand allowance. You would be safe for your entire life. What if I don't want that kind of safety? Hope asked softly. Hope, you are a strong girl, but do you think you could survive poverty? Truly? You visit the poor for your charitable works, you know what it is like, Mr. Wycliffe asked plainly. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favour. Like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. Thank you again. Now back to our story. Hope turned away. But why now? Mr. Wycliffe fixed Hope with eyes the same blue-grey hue as her own. It seemed to your mother and I that you were rather, well, directionless. You did not wish to go to London for your season, and you have shown no interest in finding a husband. Now, I do not say that you are not a joy to have at home. Your care of the children does you much credit, and you have never neglected your duties. But it is high time you were settled. I'm only nineteen, she protested. Your mother was married with you on the way by that age. Mr. Wycliffe pointed out. It's time we find you a husband. Hope could feel her cheeks growing hot, whether from anger or embarrassment she did not know. Tears pricked at her eyes for some reason and she swiped at them. Some unbidden rebellion had her blurting out. Perhaps I've already found one. The moment the words were out, she regretted them. She had never spoken aloud about her wishes or affections. In truth, she was not even entirely sure of them herself, until she the words had left her lips. Her father rounded on her slowly, eyes narrowed. My girl, there is no one suitable in the county. This only shows that I am correct in arranging this match. Hope could only stare, feeling her stomach fall to somewhere around her feet. Moreover, her father continued, I do not believe a long engagement would be to anyone's benefit. But, but what do you mean? Hope cried at last, leaping to her bare feet. You shall be married before summer's end. That is your destiny. The rectory, though not grand, was imminently comfortable. It was built in the reign of Charles II, and it showed. However, it was warm and dry, and even if it had horribly unfashionable exposed timbers everywhere, it had the great benefit of feeling homey to everyone who entered it. It could have been the numerous small fireplaces or the thick rugs that were piled all over the floors. More than likely, however, it was due to the Reverend Noah Banfield. He had been raised near Shropsborough, his father a wealthy farmer. He had been more than pleased to be offered the living as a young man and had married a fine girl from the village. His reputation was one of kindness and patience, dedication to his flock 
above all else. Noah was also a man of decided opinions. He had no truck with the new ideas that were rolling in from the continent. This suited the small village just fine, as they too had no curiosity for new ideas of equality and the pursuit of happiness. They only cared if the rains came on time and the lambs were healthy. For a young man like Robert, this was equal parts haven and prison. The pastoral countryside soothed his heart and soul, and he knew every foot of the village. By the same token, his mind ached for equally broad horizons as those that surrounded the rectory. He had been fascinated some years ago by the writing of the French and Scottish philosophers, who wrote so fervently on the state of man and nature. This had inevitably led to conflict with his father, the vicar. The vicar was a good man, but stodgily believed in the order of things. Any threat to this order was suspect and not to be brooked. Though they were neither of them disposed to raised voices, the vicar and his son had engaged in a silent battle of wills for the past few years. This particular evening was no different. They sat at their humble but sturdy dinner table, heads bent over the supper prepared by their ancient housekeeper, Mrs Campbell. Robert was in a melancholy mood, prone to brooding. He pushed his food about listlessly. He could not shake the feeling that he had failed hope in some grave manner this afternoon. Robert, the vicar said, intruding on his reverie. He looked up immediately and inwardly groaned. The vicar had pushed his plate back and now sat with his arms folded on the table. It was an attitude that Robert recognised well. It meant that an impromptu sermon was at hand. Son, it is time you found some direction in your life, the vicar said slowly. This penchant of yours for running about the countryside like a heathen, all this reading. But for what? he asked, his bushy brows creased together. Robert only sighed. He was not expected to answer. And even if he did, it would only be to repeat what he had already said a dozen times. Instead, he slumped backward in his chair a little, closing his eyes a bit too long to be merely blinking. This did not sway the vicar in any way. Undaunted, he continued. Robert did not pay full attention, as he had been privy to this particular homily enough that he could almost repeat it. The vicar's words swam about him, occasionally penetrating into his hearing. A young man needs direction. It would be for the best. This fancy of yours about sugar last year, that was outside of too much. Everyone must grow up eventually, the vicar intoned. Why, even Miss Wycliffe is taking the next steps to fulfilling her God-given role in life. That got Robert's attention. He sat up suddenly, his eyes fixed on his father. What do you mean? The vicar appraised his son, likely trying to judge his sudden interest. Her father spoke to me today. She is to be married. It is my pastoral duty to counsel and prepare her for the godly duties of marriage and motherhood. Robert's heart felt like a stone. He had never imagined that she would marry, but she was of age, and it was the expected thing to do. His mouth was suddenly dry, and he found that he had difficulty in forming words. Married, was all that he managed to croak out. The vicar nodded, turning a condescending look to Robert. Now, I know that it is difficult to imagine, but your childhood companion is quite grown now. She was every bit the free spirit you are, but even she has accepted her fate. It is ordained. The vicar paused here, steepling his fingers together. You could do worse than become ordained yourself. Robert groaned, scrubbing his face with his palms. Father, you know my feelings on the subject. The church is too constricting, too staid for my tastes. I require something with more. Scope, yes, I know, the vicar said mildly. My son, I only wish for you to be safe and secure in your life. It is a grand ambition to be one of the great thinkers or poets of the age, but scope does not put bread on the table. Nor, the vicar continued with a proud lift of his chin, does it provide nourishment for the soul? There was nothing to say to that, at least, nothing that would not devolve into further argument. Robert, 
simply sighed and said, as he was rising from his chair, I have no wish to debate about this tonight, Father, if you would excuse me. Without waiting for a reply, Robert trudged up the narrow, twisting stairs to his room. He did not remain there, however. He was blessed with a lean and able physique, and if he leaned out of his window, it was nothing for him to pull his weight onto the roof. This was his customary spot to sit and ponder, at least when the weather allowed for it. Though it was spring, the nights were still chilly. As the sun sank slowly behind the horizon in a riot of oranges and reds, the air turned cooler. Robert did not mind, pulling his knees up to his chest and wrapping his arms about them. His dark brown wavy hair, which always seemed to be contriving to fall into his eyes, fluttered a little in the crisp spring breeze that whooshed across the roof. Though there were some miles between them, to say nothing of the roads and hills that obscured his vision, Robert stared in the direction of the Wycliffe home. It was a grand manor, with more rooms than he could ever begin to know what to do with. He fancied that if he stared hard enough he could see the light in Hope's window, shining out. Chapter 4 Everything was passing by in the strangest sort of blur. Hope felt carried along, like a leaf that had fallen into a stream. If she could but get her bearings, she might have been more disposed to protest against the match her parents had so ably arranged. As it was, she could scarcely feel her feet beneath her. It seemed that every time she opened her eyes in the morning, she was being hustled out of bed, hurried along to this appointment or that. She must have a new trousseau, jewellery, fitted for new shoes. And the calls. Always, she was expected to make calls with her mother. It became clear after the first round of such visits that these were paid for the express purpose of quietly, nonchalantly, dropping the news that Hope was now engaged. It would only take one or two of these for the news to be all about the county. Hope could not begin to fathom why her mother seemed to be taking such relish in imparting this news. Hope only felt numb. This carried on for two weeks, punctuated by brief trips to the vicar's office to receive admonishments as to the proper conduct of a wife. This was the only time that Hope stirred enough to look about herself, daring to hope that she might catch a glimpse of Robert, but to no avail. This morning was no different. Hope was ushered out of bed by her maid, her mother already dressed and barging into her room to rouse her. Briefly, Hope contemplated playing at being ill, simply so she might have a few hours of privacy. Instead, she merely sighed, throwing her arm over her eyes as the maid swept the curtains from her windows. Up, dear Hope. The day is upon us and we have much to do. Go. Fetch her breakfast at once, her mother said, shooing the maid from the room with her hands. Hope sat up, curious. Usually it was only married women who breakfasted in their rooms. Reflexively, she looked down at her left hand to ensure that she had not, in fact, been married the night before while she slept. What's afoot, mother? Hope asked, sitting up and rubbing at one eye with the heel of her palm. Her mother already arrayed in a daydress of periwinkle blue, whirled around and clapped her hands together like a girl half her age. The modiste calls today. You are to be fitted for your wedding dress. Despite her love of new dresses, Hope groaned and flopped backward. Oh, mother, she sighed, staring up at the canopy above her bed. Why can't I just do as the other village girls and wear a dress I already have? Mrs. Wycliffe seized Hope's arm, suddenly pulling her upright again. Because you are not simply some village girl who will be off to milk the cows for her honeymoon. Now quit dallying and ready yourself. Sullenly, Hope rose, pulling on a quilted dressing gown. The maid reappeared with a tray of food and a steaming pot of hot chocolate. Despite herself, the smell made Hope's mouth water. She settled herself on the padded stool before her dressing table and picked at the buns, bacon and boiled eggs on the tray. While she ate, after a fashion, the maid began helping her to pull on her stockings and arranged her hair. 
They did not bother with a gown, merely pulled on a fresh chemise and her stays. At exactly ten o'clock, the modiste arrived. Well, mother will be pleased by her punctuality, Hope thought dryly. She watched her alight from the carriage, a thick book tucked under one arm. Her hair was a striking shade of auburn, arrayed simply but fashionably. Following her from the carriage was a girl of perhaps fifteen or sixteen, with bronzish hair and wide green eyes that looked up at the house with open-mouthed wonder. Hope sighed and withdrew from the window. There was a delay of some minutes, and at last the maid was showing the modiste, the girl and Mrs Wycliffe into Hope's chambers. The modiste, Hope observed, was a woman of middling years, with a square jaw that counterbalanced sharp cheekbones nicely. Her movements were quick and efficient, with no wasted gestures. Ah, and this is our bride. Then? she asked, coming forward. An accent of indeterminate origins coloured the modiste's voice. Well, she will be the loveliest bride, with or without a new gown, the modiste said with a smile. Hope, this is Mrs Kelly, Mrs Wycliffe explained, gesturing to her daughter. As you have observed, this is my daughter, Miss Hope Wycliffe. This is my daughter, Annabella, Mrs Kelly said, putting a hand on the girl's back and gently pressing her forward. She acts as my assistant and will be helping me today. Hope smiled weakly at the girl, who returned with her own timid smile. The afternoon was a whirlwind of measuring fabric samples and fashion plates. Mrs Wycliffe acted as the Tsar, making choices with absolute authority. Hope did feel a twinge of appreciation for the modiste, who attempted to ascertain Hope's input as well, but it was clear that Mrs Wycliffe had the final say on all decisions. At last Mrs Wycliffe invited Mrs Kelly to take tea with her, leaving Hope alone with the daughter. Hope did not know what to say to her, barely mustering the energy to smile wanly at her in the mirror. I expect you must have a great deal of nerves, Annabella offered. Nerves? Yes, Hope said flatly. There followed another silence that was only broken by a commotion down the hall. Despite her black mood, the cacophony made Hope grin. The Modiste's daughter caught Hope's eye again, her own expression one of curious confusion. You must forgive us. We are a household of five other children in residence at the moment, Hope explained. You have five siblings? Annabella asked, her eyes going even wider. Seven, actually. Hope clarified with a note of pride. Two of my brothers are away at school. Oh, my! Annabella breathed, stepping closer. I've always wanted a sister, but I do not know if I could manage seven. Hope laughed softly. It is rather a lot sometimes, especially when we must all go someplace together. Annabella grinned at her, then shyly reached out to touch the silver gilt hairbrush on her dressing table. Still. It must be nice to never be lonely. Ah, Hope thought, I understand you now. She had an innate fondness for all small creatures and those younger than herself, and this girl was no exception. With a gesture she stood and invited Annabella to follow her to her wardrobe. That is nice. But there are times when one longs for a moment of peace and quiet, Hope said, opening the cedar doors. Here she gestured within. Would you help me pick a dress for today? Me, Annabella asked, her eyes darting from Hope to the wardrobe. Certainly, Hope said with a sharp nod. You are the daughter of a London modiste, after all. I much admire your dress, actually. Annabella stepped back, looking down at herself as if seeing her dress for the first time. Do you really? It was a deceptively simple day dress, cut in the French style and worn with a minimum of padding. The fabric was plain linen in mossy green. But the front, held closed with delicate pins, was worked in shades of green silk thread in a motif of butterflies. Oh yes, Hope enthused, the colour suits you completely and the embroidery on the front is exquisite. Looking up, Hope could see the pride and pleasure on the girl's face. That's my specialty, 
she announced with a flush to her cheeks. Everyone says that no one can cut a gown like Mother, but I do all the embellishment. Do you really? Hope asked. You are a veritable artiste, she declared. Annabella laughed at that, and Hope was inclined to join her. She did not know why, precisely, but she liked the modiste's daughter. She had an air of simple honesty and goodness about her that Hope rather enjoyed. What shall I wear today, then? Hope asked, holding her arms out at her sides and gesturing to the wardrobe again. Annabella hesitated for just a moment, then began rifling through the racks of dresses and petticoats. She was shy at first, but then quickly began moving with more purpose, murmuring to herself, No, no, oh, that one is nice. Ooh, the brocade on this one is divine. No, no. Hope bit her lip to keep herself from laughing. At last Annabella withdrew, a dress draped over her arms. It was dove grey, cut in the older zone front style. This one, Annabella announced decisively. Really, are you sure? Hope asked, lowering her arms to touch the gown. It was made of silesia, or polished cotton, so it had a dull, subtle luster. Annabella nodded fervently. Oh, yes! The colour will look divine on you. Your skin is so pale and it will bring out your eyes. Do you not think it a little out of mode? It's all in how you wear it, Annabella said confidently, gently laying the dress across the end of Hope's bed. All the best ladies in London are recycling their gowns just now. They say there's trouble getting silk from France. But I think it's more that no one quite knows what to make of the fashions coming from France right now. Here, I have a needle and thread in my basket. And just like that, Annabella was at work, her needle whipping in and out of the bodice and skirt. Gone were the ruffles at the elbows, and with a few adjustments, the gown could be worn without pannier, just a simple roll. Hope smiled to see the girl working. Her tongue stuck out the side of her mouth. When this was done, she dove back into Hope's wardrobe and withdrew an underskirt of ivory and wine-coloured striped satin and a matching burgundy belt with a diamond slide buckle. Hope smiled at Annabella, and working together they had Hope dressed in short order. When she was dressed, Hope stood before the large mirror in her room, turning this way and that. I think, she said gravely, turning a serious expression on Annabella, who paled a little. I think you are entirely correct about this ensemble, Hope said, breaking into a grin. You shall be a great credit to your mother's business. Immediately Annabella's face broke into a grin that was so infectious, Hope could not help but return it. She had been so melancholy for the past couple weeks that she had forgotten what it had been like to have a friend that could bring her such joy and happiness. This, of course, only led to a sharp pang in her heart. She had not realised how much she had been missing Robert. At the thought of his name, her face surely must have crumpled, for Annabella was immediately rushing forward. Her hands hovered in indecision, clearly torn between doing what was proper, maintaining an appropriate distance, and what her heart wanted, comforting her new friend. Hope swallowed hard and waved away her concern. I'm fine. Mother says that all brides are troubled before their wedding day, but are settled soon enough after, she said with forced gaiety. Annabella did not look convinced, but said nothing. She nodded slowly, her deep green eyes watching Hope closely. I'm glad you're here, Hope said impulsively, reaching forward and taking Annabella's hand. Though the girl was young, there were already calluses forming on her fingers. I've had no one to talk to, and... Well, you are a bright young thing. Annabella coloured slightly at this praise, but she returned the pressure that Hope squeezed her fingers with. Does this mean we are friends? Annabella asked hopefully, shyly. I've never had a friend near my own age before. Friends? Yes, Hope said slowly, the very edges of an idea forming in her mind. Yes, we are friends indeed. Here she said, 
and pulled Annabella back over to her dressing table. Once there, she slid open a drawer, revealing little compartments with pieces of ribbon coiled carefully within. Annabella sighed softly in appreciation. You must pick one, Hope announced. We already know you have impeccable taste. Annabella blushed again, but timidly reached forward and touched a royal blue ribbon. The colour was deep and rich, like liquid sapphires. Hope took the end of it and lifted her hand, letting it unspool. With one swift, sure movement, she took up her scissors and cut it in half with one snip. Annabella watched her with wide, curious eyes. Now, Hope explained, replacing her scissors on the table. Hold out your wrist, like so. Annabella obeyed, and Hope looped it around her wrist, tying it in a neat bow on top of her wrist. Now, you do mine, she commanded, holding her own arm out. Annabella did not hesitate as she took the ribbon and tied it obligingly about Hope's wrist. There, Hope said, nodding with satisfaction. Now we have a token of our friendship. Whenever we are feeling melancholy, we need only remember each other and then we shan't feel so alone. The two girls shared a smile then, holding out their wrists so that the ribbons brushed against each other. Hope could not explain why but something in this quiet, unpretentious girl comforted her. It was good to have a... Chapter 5 As the carriage prepared to pull away from the Grand Whitecliffe estate, Annabella could not help but feel uneasy. It was not simply the unaccustomed sensation of riding in a carriage, though that was unusual enough in and of itself. It's a great courtesy, her mother had reassured her when Annabella had hesitated. No, there was something more to it. Annabella had been present for any number of fittings by this point. She had been assisting her mother properly since she was a girl of ten years. So she was used to that aspect of affairs. It was true enough, however, that she had not been privy to many bridal fittings. It was somewhat unusual, the commissioning of a dress just for a wedding. We'll be underway in just a minute, madam a solicitous footman informed them, poking his head just in the window of the carriage. Mrs Kelly gave an imperious nod, grand as a duchess. Annabella smiled a little. She wished she were a wealthy woman, simply so that her mamma could go about in a carriage and not have to traipse all over London. Mamma, she asked, her voice low so that the footman and the driver would not overhear. What is it, darling? Did... did anything bother you about Miss Wycliffe? Annabella inquired, biting her lower lip a little. Bother? What should have bothered me about her? Mrs Kelly answered, her brow furrowing. She was a perfectly lovely girl. Her head swivelled sharply to regard Annabella closely. Why? Did she say something unkind to you? Oh no, Mama, not at all. She was the very soul of kindness, really, Annabella said, absently touching the ribbon about her wrist with one finger. Satisfied, Mrs Kelly sat back again. She just seemed so sad, Annabella added quietly. Ah, pet, Mrs Kelly sighed, taking one of Annabella's hands in her own. Not every match is a love match, you understand. Some brides are, well... Sometimes their families decide what is in their best interests, she explained carefully. You mean Miss Wycliffe does not love her fiancé? I would not presume to know and neither should you, Annabella Kelly, Mrs Kelly said, pointedly, tilting her head to catch Annabella's eye. She nodded. Besides, many couples grow to love each other very much. Annabella said nothing but wrinkled her nose a little. With a call from the driver, the carriage lurched to a start. Mrs Kelly released Annabella's hand, preferring to use the journey back to London to pour over her notes from the fitting. Something compelled Annabella to twist about in her seat, however, to gaze backward through the rear carriage window. On the second floor of the fashionable red-brick façade, a lone figure watched them departing. A pale hand was raised in farewell, 
and Annabella pressed her own fingers to the carriage window. She was not sure what it was that had bonded her so instantly to Hope Wycliffe. It was not as if they had so very much in common. Maybe it was simply that their loneliness was so profound that it instantly tied their hearts together, like the ribbons on their wrists. She truly is so very alone, Annabella realised. It was a strange notion for a house full of people. Annabella was suddenly very grateful that, on an impulse she could not explain, she had taken a moment to scratch a hasty note on a piece of paper on Hope's dressing table. Should you ever have need of me, you need only ask. There was a new sort of restlessness that dogged all of Robert's movements lately. It came as a kind of tingling, jolting feeling in all of his joints and limbs. Even his head seemed full of it, his thoughts a tangled mess. He spent much of his time out of doors, which was nothing new. He'd ever been a child of nature, happiest when sat beneath a tree or laying back to gaze up at the sky. Now, however, he was ill at ease to be still, even in the fields and sparse woods that surrounded the rectory. He could not sit for more than a few moments at a time. At meals he could scarcely tarry long enough to eat more than a few bites before his leg would begin to bounce, earning a disapproving glare from his father. So Robert took too long, concerted rambles about the village and farms. He had always been one for walks, but this was different. He moved with a quickness, a purpose, as if he had a firm destination in mind and his sole mission was to reach it. The only trouble was he had no idea where he was going. He was dimly aware that he was being unconscionably rude to his father, neglecting mealtimes and walking right past callers at the rectory. This did not register any more than anything else did. All that mattered was the strange, restless tingling that seemed to emanate outward from his heart. It was a spring evening just before dinner when the answer came upon him like a thunderstorm blowing over the horizon. Robert was making his way home in a meandering, directionless sort of manner. It didn't even register, at first, that there was a carriage parked out front of the rectory, a footman standing like a statue by the open door. Robert hesitated, debating the merits of simply sneaking in the back of the rectory so as to avoid whomever was calling. He was just at the point of turning on his heel to make good on that notion when a flash of colour and movement caught his eye. It was Hope, being helped down the stairs by her father. Her dress, a dark blue satin, glowed dully in the setting sun. The shadows cast by the church, which blocked the sun, threw a blue ethereal light onto her skin. A mist was rising slowly from the warm ground, so that Robert was not entirely certain that what he was seeing was true and not simply a vision. In a moment of undeniable clarity, she happened to look over in Robert's direction. As long as he lived, he would not forget her expression. Her face had been wearing a stony mask of politeness, but there was no spark in her eye. Her entire posture seemed diminished, slumped somehow, though she still stood perfectly straight. The moment Hope's eyes met Robert's, however, there came over her a look of such profound sadness and longing that Robert heard a strange ringing in his ears. Time wound down slowly, drawing the moment out into agonising slowness. Then the moment was over, and time sped back up to the normal pace. Hope broke the spell between them first, blinking, then looking down at her feet. Mr Wycliffe finished his farewells to the vicar and hurried Hope into the waiting carriage. Robert felt pinned in place, helpless, but the strange restlessness had coalesced into a burning pain in his heart. It was only after the carriage had pulled away that the vicar noticed Robert standing there and called out to him. Robert, there you are. You have just missed Mr Wycliffe and his daughter. Yes, Robert replied, an odd lump in his throat. I... I saw them. Mechanically, he began walking forward again. You might have said hello. The vicar chastised him when he was at the doorstep. Father, Robert asked, 
still staring down the road. Something in his tone caused the vicar to soften, for he was instantly putting a hand on Robert's shoulder. What is it, my boy? the vicar asked, his voice gentle and even. Did hope... That is, do you believe that hope is quite well? Robert asked hesitatingly. The vicar pulled back a little, surprised. I find no complaint in her person, the vicar replied, peering at Robert curiously. She has always been a vision of youth and beauty, and she will make a surpassingly loving bride. This answer did not settle Robert's restless mind. But do you think she is happy? Robert pressed. Why shouldn't she be? the vicar asked rhetorically. What complaint could a young lady make about to be wed? Robert didn't know how to answer that without giving himself away, nor sounding like the foolish dreamer everyone believed him to be. He simply stared down the road for a long time as dusk fell, lingering even after the vicar had gone into his supper. He did not stir until the housekeeper came to fetch him, and even then she had to repeat his name thrice before he roused himself enough to come indoors. That night he found himself again unable to sleep. Irritated, Robert kicked the covers off and swung his legs out of bed. Lighting a candle, he sat in the creaking chair before his small desk. As ever, there were sheets of paper scattered across it, books open here and there. Scattered snippets of verse peppered some of the papers, mild by corrections and ink blots. Out of habit, he flipped the lid off his glass inkwell, took up a quill and trimmed it with the small knife at the top of the desk. The preparations to write felt good to him, the routine comforting. It was also that writing had ever made him feel better. This time, however, he dipped his pen, and with a fat drop of ink threatening to fall at any moment, his hand simply froze. The pointed tip of the quill hovered above the page, his fingers gripping it so tight he was afraid it might break. What could I possibly say? Robert thought, a little bitterly. The pieces of verse papered over his desk caught his eye. Odes to the natural beauty of the world, verses extolling the virtues of the forest, even praise to nymphs and muses. It all felt hollow and pointless. The only thing he could see was Hope's stricken face. An idea seized him, then. Perhaps it was a matter of honesty. He had never struggled for honesty when he wrote. If I cannot speak to her, then at least I can write to her, Robert thought, Hope and Hope seizing his heart. In the end, the note was simple. It was one line, unsigned. They had been friends long enough, exchanged enough letters, that Robert was confident that she would recognise his hand. Still, even if that weren't enough, Robert quietly stepped out to the front of the rectory and plucked a single cheery yellow dandelion. Without hesitating, he pressed it between the folds of the letter. How on earth do I put this into her hand? That thought drew Robert up. He would have to take his chances delivering it by hand to the household. If I set out just now, I can be there when the servants are stirring, he thought, excitement stirring him to action. He raced upstairs and pulled on breeches quickly, tucking his nightshirt in and throwing a coat on over it. He didn't bother stepping into his boots until he was outside the rectory, having pulled the door silently closed. He took off purposefully across the fields, not bothering with a lantern. After all, he had walked this way more times than he could count. Even in the dark, he did not stumble. Chapter 6 Hope tossed and turned fitfully, unable to come to rest. She pushed restlessly at the covers, finally sitting up and sighing irritably. It was nothing new. Sleep had been eluding her for some days now. Her mother had even admonished her, saying that she must make more of an effort to get her beauty sleep. Hope could not even object, for she was right. Dark circles were forming under her eyes, her cheeks were gaunt. Still feeling no small amount of frustration, Hope slipped her legs out from the blankets and tentatively touched the floor with one foot. The cold of it sent a shiver up her leg, but she braced herself nonetheless and rose. 
The calendar may have said spring, but there was a chill in the air that had hope reaching for her quilted dressing gown. Once bundled into it, she felt a little better, the weight of it comforting her. It was no mystery as to why she was chased from her bed. She had not had a full night's sleep since her parents had informed her of her betrothal. It wasn't that she had never considered her future. It was inevitable. Young ladies of good families married well, and that was it. It was that she had never considered the possibility that she would marry someone she had no affection for. She was not so naive as to think that she would be able to make a love match, but she had hoped for, well, something at least. She thought that she was able to tolerate it. That's what it was. Tolerable. She could smile and nod and grit her teeth as she received admonishments as to the duties of a wife. It was precarious. She was holding herself together with gossamer threads. It was a facade of the frailest porcelain. It began to crack and fall apart that very afternoon, when she had seen Robert. Hope supposed that she had never really considered that there would be a time in her life when she would have to give him up. It hit her full force that she would have to give him up, move away from him to wherever her future husband lived. It was not just the loss of his friendship, Hope chided herself. Even if you must wear a false face for everyone else, you must be honest with yourself, especially to yourself. Hope blew out a sigh, wrapping her arms tightly about herself. Anxious, restless, she began to pace about her room. The truth of the matter was that she was more than a little in love with Robert. He had looked wild and dishevelled that afternoon. But then he always had bits of grass in his long brown hair or stained fingers from picking berries. That was what had sparked their friendship as children. They were both more than a little feral, running barefoot through streams and across newly mown fields. But something had changed. Robert stared directly at her, and the penetrating frankness of his gaze, his eyes a little wild, had shaken her. The careful facade was gone, and she stared back at him baldly, not hiding anything. The shock of it had awoken something in her heart, something that ached and cried out in protest of her impending marriage. Don't be foolish, Hope chided herself. Like as not, you are just clinging to the first young man you can as a means to escape from your present circumstance. That made Hope pause. No, she thought slowly, that is not right. She replayed the scene in her mind, replacing Robert with the shapes of other men, cutting them out like the paper dolls of her youth. The butcher's son, the cobbler with the slender hands, even the etching she had of the Prince of Wales, none of them fit right. Her lip curled at the mere thought of putting someone else in his shoes. Oh no, Hope groaned, scrubbing her face with her hands. He's not a knight from a fairy story. He's not going to come and save you. Hands still pressed to her lips. Hope happened to glance out her window. She had always liked the view from her windows, as it overlooked the front drive with its wide avenue of oak trees lining it. This had allowed her advance warning whenever someone was approaching the house, and the chance to make good her escape usually to the rectory. At first all she could see was her own reflection. She scoffed a little at the wild hair tumbling down her back, the desperate look on her face. Gradually, as her eyes adjusted, she became aware of a figure moving through, the grey dawn. The ground was covered in a thick mist that had blanketed the whole village since the previous evening. Everything had a strange, dreamlike quality as a consequence. Therefore, Hope was not entirely sure that she was seeing what she believed she was. But no, there truly was someone coming down the lane, hugging the left side of the trees. He, for it was clearly a man, wore neither hat nor wig, so it was likely not a servant or footman. Curious, Hope pressed closer to the glass, her eyes narrowing as she stared. As the figure coalesced into view, Hope believed that she really was dreaming, for coming down the lane was Robert. 
His hair wasn't pulled back into the customary low queue he wore, and he wore no waistcoat, merely top boots and his long coat. He walked with great purpose, his eyes fixed on the house. Hope's heart nearly stopped, then began beating in double time. Acting purely on instinct, she immediately whirled about, fully intending to run downstairs and greet him at the door. She forgot that she was in her bedclothes, wholly preparing to scamper through the house in her night rail and dressing gown. She checked herself at the last minute, realising that there was no earthly way that Robert was coming to pay a formal call, not at this hour, and not dressed so informally. Instead, she sort of pranced in place for a moment, unsure of what to do. At last, she dashed to her desk and lit a candle, grasping it in the brass holder. More than likely, he's going to the servant's entrance, Hope reasoned. Probably he wishes to drop father a note, perhaps to borrow a book or... Hope couldn't bear to finish that thought. It was too much to imagine that he would drop a note for one of the maids to secret up to her. And yet, she could not stamp out that spark of hope. Down the hall, a grand and imposing clock ticked away the moments. It seemed as if hours passed, with Hope just standing in her room, clutching the brass candle holder so tightly her hand shook. At last, there came the muffled sounds of someone walking. As the footsteps approached Hope's room, her heart leaped into her throat. There was a quiet scratching at the door, and Hope sprang to open it so suddenly that the sleepy maid standing in the hall started and stared balefully at her. Letter for you, miss, the maid said, dipping her hand into her apron pocket. The maid cast a pointed glance at the candle, the merest twitch of her eyebrow saying, as if you didn't know. Thank you, Hope said, taking the letter and pressing it to herself tightly. The maid curtsied and pulled the door shut softly. Hope did not stand still instead rushing to the window again, her eyes searching frantically. Robert was retreating back up the drive, but he turned, as if sensing hope staring at him. His feet never stopped moving, instead walking backward so that he might continue gazing at hope as he left. She took her hand, still holding the unopened letter, and pressed it to the window, her hand leaving a warm imprint. Robert saw the gesture, for he raised his own hand to her, then turned and resumed his way up the lane, moving quickly. Within a few moments he was gone, swallowed up by the pre-dawn grey and the mist. Soon, it was as if he'd never been there, merely a dream that she had conjured, save for the small letter in her hand. Turning away from the window, Hope placed the candle back on her dressing table with a small clank. The fact that she saw the table at all was a miracle, for she did not take her eyes from the letter the whole time. With trembling fingers, she ripped past the familiar wax seal, a pressed dandelion silently falling to her feet. She bent to pick it up, her eyes running over the page. It did not take long, for the note was only one line long. Still, the letters burned into her eyes, and she stood there until the sky was light, repeating them over and over to herself. Chapter 7 The night of interrupted sleep was weighing heavily on Hope. She felt slow and dull, her eyes were gritty. She was in great danger of falling asleep as she served the tea in her mother's sitting room. In fact, she'd caught herself nodding off as her mother opened letters and talked aloud about the contents. Hope was expected to listen, but not really offer much commentary, so it was not noticed for quite a while what a pitiable state she was in. Hope, are you listening? Her mother barked, startling Hope. She looked around blearily, aware that she had in fact dozed off, her chin propped up in her hand. Of course, mother, Hope replied automatically, widening her eyes in an attempt to look more wakeful. Her mother gave her another disapproving look. You really must take more care, Hope. It is perfectly understandable for a bride to be anxious for her wedding day. But you mustn't let it affect you so, Mrs Wycliffe tutted. My wedding? Yes, Hope agreed blandly. 
Instinctually, her hand went into her pocket and her fingers touched the note from Robert. The feeling of it calmed her like a sort of talisman. I see only you. I see only you, she repeated inwardly, the phrase tumbling over and over in her mind. It was a poetic collection of words, exactly what she would expect from Robert. He was not the sort to make bland, run-a-day declarations. The very Robert-ness of it all would have been enough to lighten her mood. The dandelion, a humble but heartfelt gift, was now securely pressed between the pages of her prayer book. She could not begin to fathom what it had cost him to write such a note to her. He was a shy young man, prone to stammering nervously as a young child. Hope was acutely aware of the way in which he was laying out his heart for her. It made her feel tender and powerful all at once, holding such a treasure. But how could she respond? How should she respond? Her mother would surely read any letter she tried to send to him. No, her only chance was to try, and send a message by some other means. To what end? Some practical, pragmatic part of her mind demanded. You shall both confess your love, and then what? You will still be betrothed, and he will still be the poor son of a vicar. Better to let him love you from afar, and for that love to slowly burn out. Something told Hope, however, that this would not be the case. She could not imagine Robert's love ever fading away. Hope turned her head sharply, looking out the window to the garden. She didn't want her mother to see that her eyes were suddenly wet. The morning was interrupted then by a knock from a footman. The servant entered, carrying a small parcel on a silver tray. He bowed, presenting it to Mrs Wycliffe, who took it and read the card before passing it to Hope. It's for you, dear, she said. Hope's heart did a cartwheel, her throat went dry. She couldn't imagine that Robert would send her a gift so blatantly, but that did little to quell the nervous palpitations she was currently experiencing. For me? She croaked. She took the card and flipped it over to see sharp, narrow writing. For my modest bride, it read, and was unsigned. Hope blinked for a few moments until her mother passed over the parcel, which was also naturally opened. Hope found it difficult to swallow as she peered into the small brown paper box. Within was a jeweller's box, a dark blue velvet. With a shaking hand, Hope withdrew it, working the latch and opening it. Nestled inside was a ring of gold with a clear blue sapphire, surrounded by diamonds. Hope merely stared for a beat. She should be thrilled as it was her first diamonds and proof for all the world to see that she was in fact a woman to be married. Isn't that lovely, Mrs Wycliffe cooed, coming over to sit beside Hope. Come, come, we must try it on. She seized the box from Hope and, extracting the ring, held it up to admire it. Oh, but look here, there is an inscription on the inside. Fidelity, loyalty, honour, she read. Well, that is a fine sentiment, she declared, and lifted Hope's hand and slid it onto the appropriate finger. She did not seem to notice that Hope's arm was dead weight. Hope only stared at her mother for a moment, who was busy handing the packing back to the footman to be disposed of. A fine sentiment, she repeated incredulously. You cannot be serious. And why shouldn't I be? Her mother shot back. You should be pleased he was bothered to think of you at all. He is under no obligation to provide these personal gifts. He doesn't even love me. Not once has he mentioned love, Hope said, her voice rising. Oh, honestly, Hope, I don't know where you get these romantic notions from, Mrs Wycliffe sighed, exasperated. I don't love him either, Hope cried, standing and gesturing with her arms. Well, I should think not. You do not even know him. That is precisely the point. I do not know him, not at all. Hope, Mrs Wycliffe said, as if speaking to a naughty child. That is precisely what marriage is for. Oh, mother, Hope groaned and sat heavily on a plush damask chair. Has Father Banfield not been clear enough with you? 
I thought his instruction might have been doing you some good, but I am not so sure now. Perhaps you need another lesson with him, Mrs. Wycliffe said, frowning. I do not need another homily from... Hope stopped short, a realisation dawning. Yes, she said slowly, an idea forming as she said it out loud. I do believe you are right, Mother. I should go to the rectory. This very afternoon, in fact, she said, leaping to her feet again. Mrs. Wycliffe stared at her. There's no reason to be in such a rush. Your father can... No, you are quite right, Mother, Hope said, nodding and backing toward the door of the sitting room. This shouldn't wait, can't wait. I must go and have Father Banfield set me straight at once. And before Mrs. Wycliffe could do more than make a series of confused noises, Hope was out the door, rushing to her room and calling for her maid. Robert was in his usual hiding place, in the balcony of the chapel, when he heard the one of the side doors to the church open. The iron latches were heavy and rattled, so it was nigh impossible for anyone to creep silently into the church. Given that he was currently sitting on the floor with his back to the half wall around the edge of the balcony, it was not immediately apparent who it was. Robert twisted his neck and lifted slightly to see over the railing. It was only his father puttering around. He sighed and slid back down. He was not entirely sure what he was expecting, nor even really why he had hidden here. He liked this particular section well enough, mostly because someone had taken a pocket knife or a pen knife to the polished wood railing. It was an impulsive, destructive thing to do, which his father had tisked at, but Robert was charmed by it. It was a simple message, R plus J. He had no idea who the initials represented, and likely never would. Chances were good that it was carved by someone in the village for work during shearing season. Robert liked the simplicity of it. He particularly liked that someone was so moved by an impulse of love to commit such an act of vandalism. He had longed to feel such a strong love, to know what it was to feel so much for someone that he would simply disregard the rules in order to be with them. Robert sighed quietly, aware that every sound echoed in the stone walls of the chapel. The silence was broken, however, by the door to the chapel slamming open again. Robert started, as did his father, who let out a sound of exclamation. Curious, Robert clambered up to peer over the railing, seeing light pouring in from the door. Who's there? the vicar called, raising a hand to block the light from his eyes. Forgive me, Reverend Banfield, but I was told at the rectory that I might find you here, a familiar voice said. Robert was instantly scrambling to steady himself and find a better perspective without wishing to reveal himself. Hope was entering the church, a maid following some steps behind her. The vicar held his hand out to Hope, gesturing for her to come in. And so you have, so you have, the vicar said, escorting Hope down the nave to the front of the chapel. What can I do for you today, my child? Well, it's... Hope hesitated, then fixed her gaze on her maid. Agnes, why don't you go to the rectory and see if Mrs Campbell might give you a cup of tea in the kitchen? Go on then, she insisted. The maid, eager to have a moment to put her feet up, scampered off without being told twice. Would you like to sit? The vicar offered, gesturing to the stalls at the front of the chapel. Hope accepted, sinking down next to the vicar, her skirts poofing out about her as she did so. I hope you are well, the vicar continued, peering into Hope's face. She nodded, looking down at her hands. And your family? They are well too. Again, Hope nodded without looking up. And how is your son, Reverend? Hope said at last, looking up. Robert could see her profile clearly, for she wore a fashionably small hat on her voluminous hair. I have not seen Robert for some time, she said. And Robert thought he heard a tremble in her voice. If he had not known her so well, he mightn't ever have heard it. Might he be about? she asked, a note of hope in her voice. I don't believe he is, no, the vicar replied apologetically. 
He has become rather wild lately and been rather scarce. I imagine he has some new hiding place. Oh, Hope said, her face falling. Is there something I might help you with? The vicar asked, bending to peer into Hope's face. I... Hope hesitated, clearly torn. Perhaps there is, yes, she said at last. The vicar sat back, folding his hands on his lap, pleased to be of service. I wish to speak to you about marriage again. A most suitable topic for a young lady to wish to be consulted on, the vicar said approvingly. Have you read that book of sermons I gave you, the one for young ladies? Yes, that is, well, no, not entirely. My days seem so very full lately, Hope admitted contrite. The thing of it is, I wish to know the place love is supposed to have in life. Love? the vicar said, taken aback a little. Well, we are expected to love our families, to pay filial duty to our parents, which is its own form of love. Of course, we are admonished to love one another, so Christ spake. Yes, but... Hope hesitated again, wringing her hands a little. But what of love between a man and a woman? Ah, I see, the vicar said, nodding. That is a very fine thing indeed. Is it? Oh, certainly the vicar said, nodding his head sagely. The love between a man and a woman can be a guiding light for both in marriage. And what of a loveless marriage? Hope pressed, leaning forward. In my experience, which you must believe me to have, judging by the grey hairs on my head, the vicar said with a self-mocking smile, is that there is no such thing. So many years spent in such closeness and companionship inevitably cultivates a kind of abiding love. Abiding love, Hope repeated. She was silent for a moment, her brow furrowed in thought. And you believe that marriage should be entered into with a pure heart, yes? That is what you told me last week. I do, the vicar said with another nod. Robert could scarcely believe his ears. He found himself standing slowly, silently. His hands grasped the railing so tightly his knuckles turned white. To his great shock, Hope glanced sideways then, and for a fleeting moment, their eyes met. I suppose then, she said carefully, enunciating each word crisply, that the 143 psalm is so important. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Robert thought he might die of happiness at that very moment. He could not possibly be hearing what he thought he was. Clever girl, Hope, he cried happily within his heart. She had found a way to convey a message of love, and... Robert halted. What is she saying? Does she mean... Below him the Hope was rising, making her polite farewells to the vicar. As she was turning to leave, Unseen to the vicar, she stared pointedly at Robert for just a moment. She shifted her eyes to the side, then back. Robert nodded. Chapter 8 It was with one eye on the rectory that Hope dared to scamper up the hill near the church. Atop the hill, the tree, their tree, still stood guard. Her heart was beating so fast, she thought it might simply burst from her chest both from the exertion and the excitement of it all. A healthy dose of trepidation was mixed in. What if Robert wasn't there? What if she had misspoken, or he had a change of heart? But something told Hope that he would be there. It was this belief that was propelling her up the hill. She crested the hill, her eyes looking about. Her heart sank for just a moment as she looked about, not seeing Robert. And then... He stepped from behind the tree, staring at her with an expression that surely mirrored her own. Like a pair of naughty children, both of their faces broke into smiles. Robert opened his arms and Hope immediately flew into them, finding the sheltered space between his heart and his hands. I thought I had lost you, he murmured against her hair, and Hope grinned again. You nearly did she confessed, pulling back and slipping both of her hands into his. I was swept along, 
like I was caught in a great river, and I couldn't find the shore until you threw me a line. Robert ducked his head and stared into Hope's face. You are sure about this? I do not wish... He hesitated, and Hope couldn't help but be charmed by the familiar expression of Robert searching for words. I do not wish to merely be an escape, or for you to have regrets about... any of this. There's going back. Oh, you... Hope broke into breathless laughter and threw her arms about Robert's neck, nearly knocking them both off balance. Hope did not care. She did not care if they went tumbling all the way down the hill in that moment. She did not care if the entire neighbourhood saw them. She did not care if her reputation was in tatters. She only cared that Robert's arms went so very nicely about her waist and the lightness in her soul that she had not felt for weeks. Very well. Robert said, releasing her and taking one of her hands as if to start off down the hill. We can leave right now and be in Scotland by... Wait, Hope said in an urgent whisper, pulling him back behind the tree. You mean elope? Right now? Well, yes. You really are a romantic, aren't you? Hope said, grinning at him affectionately. Let's be smart about... This. When my family discovers me missing, they will be on us in a trice. I'll be dragged to the altar within the hour. Robert frowned thoughtfully. Yes, you're right. We must come up with a plan. I've some savings and a trust from my uncle. Hope nodded. I've some jewels we might sell. Oh, Hope, no, Robert said, his face creasing anxiously. You mustn't. Yes, I must, Hope insisted. I would sell every pearl and stitch of satin I own if it meant I might live a quiet life with you. Impulsively, Robert lifted the hand he was still holding and pressed a kiss to it, giving rise to a batch of butterflies in Hope's stomach. What have I ever done to deserve you? You were Robert, Hope answered simply. Now I must go before Agnes comes looking for me. Be patient. We will think of something. With a feeling of pointed loss, she slipped her hand free of Robert's. She turned back around, a thought occurring to her. Can you get a horse? Robert thought for a moment, folding his arms and leaning one shoulder against the trunk of the tree. I believe so, he answered slowly. The ostler owes me a favour and would give me a good price. Robert smiled a little ruefully. It's a shame. We don't have anyone that could help us. Hope stared at Robert, the seeds of an idea she had been entertaining for some time finally sprouting. I think... I think I do know someone that might render aid. Hope shook her head, resuming her descent. I must write a letter. Don't lose heart. We shall find a way, she called back over her shoulder. It made her feel immeasurably strong and safe to know that Robert still stood at the top of the hill like a lighthouse on a craggy and treacherous shoreline. After collecting her maid, Hope caught a glimpse of Robert still standing there, watching over her. It took a great deal of willpower for to resist the impulse to go running back to him, to simply go running off across the countryside. The dressmaker's shop, owned by Annabella's mother, was small but exceedingly well regarded. Mrs Kelly had worked hard upon her arrival to London, and her head for business combined with her skill with a needle had ensured her success. Annabella was proud of their success, particularly because it was hard won. Though she had never had any formal education, her mother had ensured that she was well-spoken and well-read. There was a significant amount of attention placed on the importance of learning sums, as Mrs Kelly stressed again and again. Annabella would be responsible for keeping the accounts of the shop some day. Most of her days, however, were spent sitting near her mother, watching and learning. By the time she was seven, she could sew an entire men's shirt or petticoat on her own. So it was today. She had taken up her customary spot by her mother, both of their heads bent over their work. Sometimes they would hum, her mother tapping the heel of her boot against the leg of her stool to keep time. They worked 
in companionable silence today, the weather having turned rainy. It always put Mrs. Kelly in a melancholy mood and seemed to bring on a cough that was loath to depart. The silence was interrupted by the arrival of a postboy. He barreled into the store, bundling along his heavy leather bag and nearly upsetting at least two of the carefully dressed mannequins. Steady on! Mrs. Kelly barked, her needle never ceasing. Do not blow into my store like a typhoon! Beg pardon, missus, the boy said, reaching up with one red hand to tug at the front of his floppy cloth cap. I've letters for you, he added unnecessarily. Annabella did her best to hide a smile as Mrs. Kelly stood, affecting a great sigh and putting her work down. It was necessary for a woman with her own business concern to be formidable, and Annabella's mother had perfected the act. In truth, Annabella knew her to be a soft touch, especially when it came to children. Well then, let's have them, she said, holding her hand out to the postboy expectantly. Her nose was thrust into the air in the manner of a great society duchess, which always made Annabella grin. She was not sure if it was an imitation or an impersonation, but it never failed to amuse her. Sheepishly, the postboy rooted around in his bag and produced a bundle of letters tied with twine. Here you are, missus. Good lad, Mrs Kelly said, deigning to press a small coin into his hand and was customary. Wait there. Have you had anything to eat today? Not since breakfast, Mum, the boy answered. Mrs Kelly sighed and reached into her pocket again, pressing another, larger coin into his hand. The bun cellar should be at the end of the street this time of day, likely hiding under the arcade roof from this downpour. That's real silver, that is, the boy gasped, staring at the coin shining brightly in his palm. Oh, thank you, missus. I'm your man through and through. If you've ever a need, you just ask for Ned Smalls at the postie, and I'll see it done, he cried, doffing his hat again. Mrs Kelly grunted, shooing him out of her store with one hand. Away with you! She was seized by a fit of coughing then, which she endeavoured to disguise as delicately as she could. Go on now, out of my shop before you turn the silk with your filthy hands. The postboy, or Ned, smiled cheekily, fully copping to the fact that Mrs Kelly was a soft touch underneath it. Annabella smiled too, meeting his eye. The boy scampered off, and Mrs Kelly closed the door behind him, pressing her other hand with the letters to her chest. Ah, oh, this damp air, she muttered. Annabella said nothing. She knew her mother needed to see a doctor, but she refused. It was a fight they had gone through many times before. Mrs Kelly resumed her seat and untied the bundle. Pah, the rains got to them, she grumbled, setting the letters out. Some of the addresses were, in fact, smudged from the rain. Here, Annabella, this one's marked for you, she added. Me? Annabella asked, surprised. Carefully, she laid down the trim she had been pleating and reached for the letter. She raised it carefully and flipped it over to look at the seal. Who would be sending me a letter? Mrs Kelly said nothing but watched Annabella carefully with a worried face. Carefully, Annabella slid a finger beneath the seal and unfolded the letter, flipping it over quickly to see the signy. Oh, she said, her face lighting up and smiling at her mother. Tis from Hope Wycliffe. How nice, she said flipping the letter back over and beginning to read silently to herself. Miss Wycliffe, Mrs Kelly repeated, mollified. She began sorting through her own stack of letters, holding one up and squinting at the rain-smeared words. What does she say? Annabella did not answer immediately, for it was a most peculiar letter. She was not in the particular habit of receiving letters, having no one to correspond with. She was also not well acquainted with many young ladies, especially not wealthy ones, so she could not say for certain what was a normal letter and what wasn't. However, she had read and heard enough to have some understanding of what genial correspondence should be, and she was fairly certain this was not it. It began well enough with the regular pleasantries. My dear Miss Kelly, 
I hope that you and your dear mother are quite well. I have heard the weather has turned poorly in London. I hope this is not true, as I always like to think of London in the springtime. The weather is pleasant enough in Shropshire, with the lambs being turned out to the fields now. It is a very pleasant sight. And then a most unexpected thing happened. The impersonal, somewhat bland tone shifted quickly, and the words became smaller and less flowing, as if written in a great hurry. Miss Kelly, Annabella, if I may, for I feel we are close enough now to use our given names. I cannot tell you the courage and comfort our newly sealed friendship has brought me over the past days. I confess that I have had little else to buoy me until this afternoon. Please forgive this strange shift in tone. It is imperative that I do not rouse suspicion, and my dear mother has a habit of reading over my shoulder as I compose correspondence. Should there be strange sentences out of context paragraphs, please attribute it to my overabundance of caution. Likewise, should your mother show concern, please simply tell her that I'm seeking only a sample of the fabric for my wedding dress so that I might find matching shoes. Right on cue, Mrs Kelly spoke up louder this time. Annabella, what does Miss Wycliffe want? Annabella tore herself away from the letter and looked directly at her mother. She says she would like a sample of the fabric for her wedding dress so that she might get shoes that match. A line appeared between Mrs Kelly's brows. That is a lot of paper to simply ask for a patch of silk. Annabella laughed weakly. Yes, well, I believe that she is lonely, truth be told. I'm not sure she has anyone else to speak to about wedding preparations. This seemed to appease Mrs Kelly. Well, that is likely true. The girl seemed rather on her own up there in that big house, away from polite society. Hmm, Annabella agreed, already reading on as quick as she could. I must also tell you that your little note in which you pledged to be of aid if you could has given me no small amount of security. It seems a terrible imposition to... And Farmer Brown's cow has just had the most darling little calf, with a little muzzle soft as any velvet in your shop. You would scarce believe how fast it grows it is already able to see over. Call upon your friendship in this manner already, but I am truly in dire straits. The truth of the matter is that I will be attempting a flight away from my family and Shropshire. London is my initial destination, and as you are familiar with the city, I am hoping you will know of a place where I might take shelter for a night or two. I find that I cannot go through with my marriage. My husband-to-be is not the man I love, and I cannot tie myself to someone so. Mrs Smythe had on the very same chapeau if you can countenance it. She attempted to claim that because she had deigned to put silk flowers of purple instead of pink, that it was entirely different, but everyone that saw it knew. My reasons are irrelevant. Just know that I am choosing my own happiness. Perhaps that makes me a bad, selfish girl, but I cannot imagine that this is what God intends for marriage. If you are able to help, please respond promptly. Please know that you are, and always shall be, my trusted friend, even should you decline to help. I understand completely, and shall love you just the same. Your devoted and loving friend, Hope Wycliffe. Annabella was rather stunned. She simply stared at the letter, certain that she could not possibly have read it correctly. Her eyes were suddenly quite dewy, and she couldn't begin to explain why. Quickly she swiped at her eyes surreptitiously before her mother could see. Shall you write back to her then? Her mother asked, from over her shoulder, having turned away to consult one of her accounting books. Annabella was unable to answer. Her heart was torn. She knew that she wished to help her friend, had glimpsed just a touch of her misery. But she also did not wish to do anything that would endanger her mother's reputation or business. Annabella, shall you write? Chapter 9 There was a strange atmosphere about the entire village of Shropshire, as if just before a storm. Much of this was attributed to the upcoming nuptials, 
as the wedding of Miss Wycliffe to a lord had set the entire neighbourhood a twitter. Cakes were being ordered, ribbons purchased by the spool, carriages polished and hats brushed. Those of the village that had secured invitations were smug for weeks. Those that had no chance of going were determined to observe from outside the church, hoping for a glimpse of the bride. The entire village, even the farms, were in a tizzy to scrub and shine themselves into respectability. It was all a bit much, really, but there was little else to divert the county. Later, in the years that followed, there would be some that would insist that they had felt something in their waters, that there was more afoot. Of course, none of them said anything at the time, so this was generally viewed with a heaping spoon of doubt. Those that did have a suspicion kept it to themselves. Robert was keenly aware of this odd feeling, being plagued by anticipation and eagerness by turns. He had been to visit the ostler, trading a sum of money for the best horse in the stable. He had written some poetry for the ostler to give to his sweetheart last summer. And the horse dealer was inclined to be kind to him. Thus, Robert managed to procure a far greater steed than the modest sum would have ordinarily gotten him. He exercised the horse regularly, putting the solid grey gelding through his paces, building his stamina. He did this under cover of early morning or evening, not wishing to draw attention to himself. The ostler saw, of course, but he kept his own counsel, knowing a little something about clandestine activities. There was no word from hope, but Robert did not lose faith. When he saw her in church on Sunday, she wore a dandelion tucked into the satin ribbon of her hat. The sight gladdened him like sun after rain. Perhaps the most astonishing thing to him was that his father suspected nothing. Having been treated to a number of lectures as a young man about God being able to discern the hearts of men, he was more than a little smug that he was, thus far, undetected. But the vicar was preoccupied these days. He had never presided over a wedding so illustrious, and likely never would again, and he intended to make the most of it. Robert had even caught him practising a stately, dignified walk down the chapel's centre aisle, complete with condescending nods to an invisible congregation. If Robert were to feel guilty about something in this entire scheme, it was likely the fact that he was taking such an important occasion from his father. This is not to say that he was relishing the idea of deceiving the Wycliffes. They had ever been kind to him, and he disliked doing them a poor turn. He hated the thought of hope trapped in a loveless marriage of convenience more, and his love for her outweighed everything. So he continued to make provisions, discreetly packing a leather saddlebag with his best waistcoat and fresh shirts. He had secured an oil lantern and kept the wick trimmed and the reservoir filled. The spare banknotes that he'd withdrawn were divided into rolls and hidden in various places. One was in a thick wool sock in a knapsack, another in the toe of his boot, one with the ostler, with strict instructions to keep it safe until he sent for it. All the while, the date for the wedding inched closer and closer, inevitable. Robert began to worry that they may be putting off their departure too long. It was a titbit from his father that at last raised his spirits and told him that he was not long for waiting. It was over a luncheon of cold chicken and small pies that the vicar casually said, It appears Miss Wycliffe will be taking a small tour to celebrate her engagement. Robert nearly dropped his fork onto his plate. Forcefully, he arranged his features into an expression of casualness. Is she? he asked faintly. Did she say where she would be doing? Apparently to visit an aunt in the north. She told me as much this afternoon and made heartfelt apologies that she would not be able to keep her appointment with me this week. This week, Robert thought. That was kind of her, he said, cutting into his egg and scallion pie with a bit more force than was necessary. Well, she always has been the soul of kindness. She wished for me to make her farewells to you in particular, as she was departing with such little notice. Here the vicar stopped, carefully replacing his fork and knife across the plate and folding his arms on the table. 
Now, my son, he began, leaning forward and fixing Robert with the paternal look that meant a lecture was in the making. Inwardly, Robert groaned, but kept his eyes firmly on his plate. I know that Miss Wycliffe has been your companion these long years, and I know that you will surely miss her, as we all will. But she is being a good and sensible girl, an obedient daughter, and following the direction given by her parents. She is taking the next step in her life. The vicar paused and placed his hand on Robert's shoulder. I think it is time you did the same, my boy. You seem to be, well, floundering, I think, these past years. I had hoped you would put more thought into a respectable vocation. But I see I must be more direct. Robert took a deep breath, steeling himself, and gently put his own silverware down. You are right, father, he said. This was the first time he had said those words in a long time and the vicar responded by lifting his bushy salt-and-pepper brows, almost clear off his forehead. I have not been giving my prospects due consideration. You will be pleased to know that the future has been my greatest concern for the past couple weeks. Little else has preoccupied my thoughts. In fact, Robert said, rubbing his chin, I can honestly say that I have done nothing but plan for what my future holds recently. Have you really? Well, that is most heartening to hear, the vicar said, gently clapping Robert on the shoulder before withdrawing his hand. And what have you concluded? It's only the beginnings of an idea just now, father, Robert replied easily, but I think that I may have finally figured out what it is I wish to do with my life. I promise all will be revealed in due course. The night of escape came at last. Hope had received a reply from Annabella just the day previous. It was a short note, simply saying, You need only ask, accompanied by a drawing of a butterfly. The return address was printed very carefully and clearly. She sent a message to the rectory for Robert, taking the chance. It was a risk she had to take. It was short and encoded within Bible verse, as her previous message to Robert had been, For whither thou goest, I will go and where thou lodgest I will lodge, thy people shall be my people. This was followed with the number ten, and a rough drawing of a tree with a swing. Annabella had picked the hour deliberately. Dinner would be just over, and she could excuse herself easily. It was better for her to start out with a full stomach, she reasoned. That would also give her the whole afternoon to make the final preparations. Quietly, quickly, she swept, as many of her jewels and silk stockings into her, the pockets tied about her waist as she could. They were very good, deep pockets, large enough to fit an entire loaf of bread and then some. Hope checked the twill tape that held them up at least a dozen times, ensuring that it was strong enough. She shooed her fine dresses, opting instead to place her dark blue wool riding habit at the front of her closet. It would help her to put it on quickly when the time came. When the time came, Hope repeated to herself. The phrase gave her a rush of butterflies in her stomach. The thought of leaving had been an abstract thing, a distant dream for days now. Preparing for it made it real, giving Hope a thrill of exhilaration. It was all Hope could do to swallow down mouthfuls of dinner. The family had an excellent cook, a Frenchman that Hope secretly suspected of being a nobleman fugitive of Robespierre. His food was delicious, and Hope was sorry that she could not savour it in the manner in which it deserved. Hope was practically vibrating in her seat, doing her level best not to rush off. She wished to seem normal, above all else, lest she rouse suspicion. This was easily accomplished, really, as the children were being ushered off to bed, having dined earlier with the governess. Only Justine dined with the adults, and only when it was just the family. Clearing her throat, she said, Mother, do not forget that I am departing early tomorrow morning for Great Aunt Hortensia's. When was this decided? I'm not sure that's... Her mother started, frowning. One of the children was lifting their face up for a kiss goodnight, distracting her. 
Now please wait a moment, Lottie. I am speaking to Hope. No, don't push your brother. Hope made a show of huffing and folding her arms. Really, Mother, you're the one that arranged the whole thing. You wanted me to spend time with the old bat so that she might be kind to Kit when he comes of age. If I don't have to go, all the better. Oh, no, you don't, young miss, her mother rejoined, bending so that Michael might put his chubby arms about her neck. Just because you've been afforded more freedom as a lady about to be married does not mean you may shirk your familial duties. Oh, very well, Hope sighed. I suppose it won't hurt to spend some weeks in the North Country when the summer heat sets in. You just be polite to your great aunt, Mrs Wycliffe said sternly. Remember your manners and don't spend the whole time running about out of doors like a heathen. Mrs Wycliffe chose this moment to give a pointed look to her husband. Isn't that so, John? Mr Wycliffe was engaged in the very serious business of dinner still. He had long ago adopted a strategy of staring straight down at his plate and focusing all of his attention on the food therein. This excused him many uncomfortable conversations and much of the chaos that came from having so large a clutch of children. Mrs Wycliffe sighed loudly and, Hope suspected, nudged Mr Wycliffe with the toe of her shoe under the table. I said, Isn't that so, John? She repeated emphatically. Hope must be kind to her great aunt for the sake of her brothers. Mr Wycliffe looked up and about the room, noting the line of children coming and going like a procession of ducklings, then down the table at Hope. What? Yes, of course she must do. Your great aunt hasn't long for this world, and a kind word from you could make all the difference. Why does Hope get all the new things? Justine broke in, her voice pitched at a whine. Just because she's going to be married, and now she gets to go on a trip. Justine, cease your whining, else you'll be sent to the nursery like the other children, Mrs Wycliffe warned, rubbing one of her temples. Secretly, Hope was grateful beyond measure for Justine's interruption. It added a layer of realism to the conversation. Moreover, Hope had been afraid that if the discussion lasted much longer, her parents would begin trying to figure out how great Aunt Hortensia was related to any of them. The truth of the matter was that she did not exist, and was nothing more than a clever ruse dreamt up by Hope in an effort to delay the discovery of her running off. Hope affected another great sigh, pressing the back of her hand to her forehead. Since I must rise so early, I should retire to bed, I think. The children have given me a bit of a headache. Mrs Wycliffe shot her a knowing look. Hope paused at each of her parents, pressing a gentle kiss to their cheeks and giving her farewells as she would not see them in the morning. She crossed her fingers behind her back as she did so, hoping that it would ward off any repercussions for her lies. Chapter 10 Hope walked slowly through the dim halls, clutching one of the candles left downstairs for the family to take upstairs as they retired for the night. She did not entirely wish to rush. She took her time, running her fingers over the furniture, the walls, the stair railing. The full understanding that she was likely never to see her home again was tugging at her heart, and she wished to farewell as much of it as she could. Before continuing down the corridor to her own apartment, Hope paused at the nursery. The governess's voice carried through the crack in the not-quite-closed door. She was a woman of about forty years, with a sharp face and soft hands. Her voice rose and fell in a brogue. Hope was firmly of the opinion that Scottish governesses were superior to all the rest, mostly because they told the best stories about fairies and elves. She was attempting to round the children into their beds. Hope peeked in, smiling a little wistfully at the chaos within. The governess did not seem to mind, however. Hope could not remember her once raising her voice. She spotted Hope and acknowledged her with a gracious nod. Good evening, Missy, she said, beckoning her in. 
Come to tell the wee beasties your good nights. I have, Hope said, stopping to pet the foreheads and press kisses to others. She helped the governess tuck them all in, drawing blankets up to chins. Now I hope that you will all be good for Miss Kinnear. A chorus of solemn nods, and only a little giggling met that. Miss Kinnear sighed and took up a place in her rocking chair in the corner near the fireplace. Might I ask you something, Miss Kinnear? The governess nodded, and Hope stepped closer, thinking quickly. It's just... Well, you've always told us all the best stories, and as I am to be a wife and mother soon, I was wondering if that is a product of your Scotch upbringing. Likely so, young miss, Miss Kinnear said with a smile. My own grandmother was a veritable trove of stories. Like as not, you'll have to find a volume of stories from across the border. I'll be travelling north tomorrow, so maybe I can make a special journey to find one then, Hope said with forced casualness, stooping to tuck a blanket around a pair of wiggling feet in one of the little cots. How long would you say it takes to get to the Scottish border? Oh, I don't know these days, Miss Kinnear said. It took me about twenty days in a Kendal flying wagon to reach London, though my cousin managed it in just ten days in a stagecoach just last year. If you've a good driver and the weather is fine, that should work just fine. Hope swallowed, then nodded. Thank you for that, Miss Kinnear. She turned away, her eyes burning as she walked through the nursery. She dared not look at her siblings, but headed directly out the door, latching it softly. Her own room was a quiet haven by comparison, but this only meant that she had nothing with which to drown out her thoughts. The full weight of her departing was pressing in on her. With a trembling hand, she reached into her crowded pocket and withdrew the note that Robert had sent. It was creased, and the corners folded from hope, having taken it out and reread it so many times. There was a small yellow stain from where the dandelion had been pressed. She read his words again and again until she felt stronger. As she was reading, she glanced down at her left hand. She had continued wearing the ring Lord Tilney had given her to keep up appearances. Now, however, it felt as if it weighed as much as an anchor, keeping her shackled to a future she did not want. With a disdainful curl of her lip, she pulled it off, holding it up to the light. Such a small thing to keep me chained to a man I do not want, she murmured. She was of half a mind to simply throw it, letting it lay wherever it fell. Instead, she stood still staring at it and made her way to her dressing table. Deliberately, carefully, she removed the velvet box it had arrived in from a drawer and replaced the ring. Just as deliberately, then, she placed the box on her dressing table. It would hopefully take some time before anyone thought to search her room. When they found the ring, hopefully they would understand it for the rejection it was. And now there was nothing to do but wait. Her maid would not be up for another half an hour while she ate her own dinner. Aimlessly, she kicked her feet, then lay back and tried to calm her racing heart. She held her left hand up above her head, the bareness of it relieving her. Then she tried imagining what it would be like, wearing a simple band with no jewels, and the image of it pleased her. Perhaps not even gold. Silver is good enough for me, she thought with a moony little grin. Mrs. Banfield, she whispered to herself. This immediately sent her into a fit of giggling, which she stifled by placing both hands over her mouth. It had been predictably easy for Robert to slip from the rectory. The vicar did not believe in keeping to fashionable mealtimes, viewing them as a product of London with some disdain. He ate a simple, hearty dinner, and then would retire to his bedroom for a small glass of sherry and read a verse or two from the Bible before sleeping. It was no secret when he did fall asleep, as he snored with such gusto that it threatened to rattle the very rafters of the house. Robert lay in his own bed, wide awake and fully dressed, his pocket watch open on the nightstand. He kept a small candle lit, watching the seconds and minutes tick by. By nine o'clock the vicar's snores came reverberating down the hall. 
Robert sat up then and quietly slipped into his long coat. Collecting his watch and saddlebags, he took a last check of his room. He was a little sad to be leaving it, his beloved books and collection of poetry and art. The loss panged his heart, but a life without hope was not one that he was prepared to live. Donning a simple tricorner hat, he gave one last look around. He had half a mind to write a note and leave it on his desk, an apology perhaps, but then he was not sorry in the slightest. He regretted the pain he would cause to people he cared for, but he could never be sorry that he was going to be with Hope. The ostler had yawned openly as Robert came to collect gunpowder. Robert could not entirely blame him, as the hour was quite late and night had fallen. There wasn't much cause, generally speaking, to stay up more than an hour past dinner in Shropshire. Gunpowder, too, seemed to blink wearily at Robert, incensed at having his own sleep disturbed. Don't tell father I've gone unless you are asked, Robert said once he had swung up into the saddle. He dug about in his pocket and handed over a folded piece of paper. For your lady, love. The ostler nodded, acknowledging both the request and the payment. When the stable doors closed behind him, Robert had a sense of finality. The first chapter of his life was over and another was about to begin. He took a deep breath and turned the horse toward the Whitecliffe estate. The moon was full, thankfully, so he was able to consult his pocket watch with relative ease. At exactly ten o'clock, after carefully picking his way through the sparse woods near the manor, he pulled up at the tree with a swing. His nerves were high, and as a consequence he nearly jumped clean out of the saddle when there was a rustling from behind the stone wall. Robert! A voice hissed, and then Hope stood up. Another smaller figure was with her as well, holding a bundle under her arm. Robert could not help but grin when he saw her, though he spoke with some concern. You brought your maid? I needed help dressing and sneaking out of the house, Hope explained. She gestured with her head toward the horse, and the maid stepped forward and passed the bundle to Robert, who secured it in front of him. Hope, meanwhile, stepped up on the wall and then settled herself delicately on the back of the horse behind Robert. After a moment's hesitation, she put her hands tentatively on his waist. Now remember, Agnes, not a word to anyone, Hope said, and Robert could feel her gesturing behind him. The maid didn't say anything, merely curtsied in acknowledgement. Gunpowder, restless, champed at the bit and turned in a restless circle. Robert obliged, turning the horse about again, watching the maid scurry back to the house. In the dark, only her white cap was visible. Are you ready? Robert asked, turning his head slightly to speak to Hope. She did not answer either, but wrapped her arms tightly about Robert's waist. It was as good an answer as any. Despite the anxiety he was feeling about the journey, the clandestine nature of it, Robert could not help but smile in the dark. They started slow, not wishing to draw attention to themselves by making a great deal of noise. It was also imperative to save Gunpowder's stamina, as he would have to carry the two of them all the way to London. Despite the dark, however, and their slow pace, they made surprisingly good progress, due in no small part to the fact that Robert knew the road so well. They began their journey with a lightness of spirit, and Hope was inclined to hum cheerfully in Robert's ear. They were both alive with the spirit of adventure, the thrill of having broken free in true independence from a future that was despised. When they reached the highway, Robert loosed his hold on gunpowder and the horse broke into a gentle loping canter that ate the ground up. Like Lot, neither Hope nor Robert were inclined to look behind them. For them, their future lay ahead, and there was little inducement to gaze back. Unfortunately, this meant that they did not see the gathering clouds that delayed the sunrise. Chapter 11 
Though the private apartment they called home was separated from the shop by a sturdy wooden floor, Annabella could still hear her mother's hacking cough if she listened closely. Mrs Kelly's chest had not cleared and neither had the skies. In fact, London had been besieged by something of a torrential downpour for the better part of the month of April. The roads leading to and from the city were a quagmire, and more than one coach had become stuck. Why Annabella should be concerned about the state of the roads was a bit of a mystery, or it would have been if anyone had noticed. As it was, her mother had retired to bed where she had a warm brick to warm her feet, leaving Annabella in charge of the shop. The young mistress of this domain took great pride in this responsibility. Her pride at such a charge was somewhat tempered, however, by worry. She was half glad that she was left to her own devices, or else her mother would likely have seen her anxieties in a trice. Every time she heard the sound, hooves clattering up the street, Annabella was induced to peer out the shop windows, craning her neck. This was a folly, as the shop was well placed in a busy section of London, not far from the arcade. Consequently, Annabella's progress on the embroidery she had been left with was, well, lacking. Hope's last letter, a quick note with only a date and the word evening, indicated that she should have arrived by now. But the bells from the churches had just rung out six times past noon and there was no sign of them. Sighing, Annabella put her work down and headed upstairs to take her mother some dinner. It was only a soup that had been left to bubble all day, but the smell filled their small but well-appointed rooms. Annabella laid thick slices of cheese over the top, with sippets hidden below. Her mother was quite fond of melted cheese and well-buttered sippets, and Annabella hoped it would induce her to eat. She was glad to see her mother sitting up in bed, her hands deftly working on buttonholes for a women's whisket. Still, the candlelight danced across Mrs Kelly's face, revealing the dark circles beneath her eyes. Annabella refused to acknowledge that, however, and forced herself into a cheerful tone. Good evening, Mama, she greeted warmly, placing the bowl of soup on the small table next to the bed. Oh, that's lovely. Who is that for? Mrs Kelly did not look up, but smiled a little, holding it up. It was a lovely patterned damask silk with painted flowers. It's for Lady Montjeffrey's summer shooting party. I am not sure about this fad for women in men's togs, but it is pretty. I will grant you that. Annabella smiled a little to herself. The past few years had been a trying time for fashion, what with the styles coming out of the revolutionary camps. I've heard that all the men in Paris are wearing trousers now. Annabella commented, producing a linen napkin from her pocket and passing it to her mother. Mrs Kelly stared at her daughter. What, like tradesmen? Where is the elegance in that, I ask you? Annabella's grin widened, in spite of her worry. Now, Mama, you only say that because you shall miss all the calves on display. Mrs Kelly scoffed. Away with you, you cheeky baggage she said, swatting Annabella good-naturedly. Is all well with the store? Yes, Annabella said. I sold a fan and a pair of gloves. I'm going to continue working downstairs for quite some time, so I won't disturb you. I expect it shall be a quiet evening. Behind her back, Annabella crossed her fingers. But Mrs Kelly was not paying much attention. She had spilled a bit of soup and was dabbing at it with the napkin. Hemming Miss Wycliffe's gown. Yes, Annabella said. She turned to go, then turned back to her mother. Mama, do all parents choose their daughter's husbands? Not all, no, but it is a matter of some importance and not to be taken lightly in hand, Mrs Kelly replied, still dabbing. She looked up suddenly, focusing on Annabella. Why do you ask? Annabella attempted a casual shrug. I suppose Miss Wycliffe has just been on my mind lately, she said half-truthfully. Ah, Mrs Kelly said, nodding sagely. Well, never you mind that, my girl. There are two paths open to most women, marry love or marry for security. For a select few, there is a third option, 
Mrs. Kelly said, setting aside her soup and lifting her work again. That of independence. You shall have to decide which is right for you when the time comes. Annabella nodded and backed toward the door again. The wind chose that moment to pick up again, the rain lashing the window harshly. I'd best go down and make sure all the shutters are closed, she said, and made good her escape. Dark had fallen quickly, augmented by the pewter clouds that had rolled in during the evening. What had started as simply a gloomy day had turned into a stormy evening. Outside the snug security of the shop, Annabella could hear the shouts of people attempting to get inside before they were drenched or blown over. Annabella had just settled onto a stool in the back workroom when there came a pounding on the back door, nearly frightening her out of her wits. Slowly she stood, swallowing hard. Her mother had warned her time and again about opening the back door after dark, having punctuated her warnings with colourful and gruesome stories of robbers and murderers. Swallowing hard, Annabella lifted a candlestick and slowly approached the door as if it were a beast that might decide to take a swipe at her. The knocking came again, more insistent. Tremulously, Annabella put her lips very near the door, and speaking loudly to be heard over the rain, she asked, Who goes? Miss Kelly, is that you? A voice replied. Annabella immediately unbolted the door, opening it a crack. In the dark alley, there stood a man clutching the reins of a horse. On the horse was a bundle that may have had the vague shape of a woman beneath the blankets, wrapped about her. All three were so thoroughly drenched as to have the look of someone half drowned. Indeed, the man's face, though handsome, was drawn and pinched, the eyes hooded with fatigue. He leaned heavily upon the doorframe, his shoulders hunched to ward off the worst of the wind and rain. Miss Kelly, he repeated, peering into Annabella's face. I've brought Miss Wycliffe. She said we might find shelter with you for the night. Miss Wycliffe, Annabella gasped. Yes, of course, quickly. Oh, you poor things, she cried, stepping aside to allow them to pass. The young man nodded gratefully and favoured her with a tired smile. He turned back to the horse, and with the gentlest of gestures, he coaxed Miss Wycliffe down, catching her about the waist and supporting her to the door. Please, see if you can warm her, he said, his eyes creasing with worry. It has not been an easy journey for her and she is quite worn out. I must tend to the horse. Is there a livery nearby? Annabella nodded, taking Miss Wycliffe's arm. Just around the corner there and two streets over. Mr Carson runs a very good stable. The young man nodded and turned to lead the clearly wearied horse away. Annabella shut the door firmly against the rain and found Hope struggling to unwind the scarf about her head. Springing into action, Annabella helped her, letting the scarf fall to the floor with a sodden plop. Once freed, Hope shook her head and gave her friend a tired but radiant smile. You cannot imagine how glad I am to see you, she said her voice roughened from fatigue and the damp air. I was so worried I nearly gave you up, Annabella said, pushing Hope's clearly cold, stiffened hands out of the way and helping to remove more wet garments. I thought you might have simply been blown away in this gale. We nearly were, Hope said, shrugging her shoulders to remove the blanket from them. A tree came down just in front of us as we were approaching the city. It's a miracle Robert was able to keep the horse on the road. Have you been riding all night? Annabella asked, beginning to work on the buttons of the dark riding habit. It was so wet that it was impossible to tell its original colour. We have, Hope admitted. We stopped to eat breakfast and let the horse drink, but we've spent the better part of the day in the saddle. With this, she winced and flexed her legs. I shan't ever be able to walk again at this rate. And poor Robert, I cannot begin to imagine the state of his hands. Well, at least I have something dry for you to put on. It's a lucky turn that we had your measurements already, Annabella said, 
grunting a little as she took the weight of the wet wool jacket portion of the habit. You made me a dress? Hope inquired, her face lighting up a little at the prospect. It's nothing like what you're used to, but it's dry and soft, Annabella said with a modest little shrug. Hope sighed, unwinding the yards of cotton cravat about her neck. That sounds like heaven. I've some soup for you too as well, Annabella continued. She couldn't explain it, but the more that she helped Hope, the more her heart was gladdened. Annabella bustled about, finding dry clothes for Hope and preparing some bandages for Robert's hands, just in case. She did her best to hang the wet things to dry, but that was a fool's errand. By the time that Robert returned, Hope was more or less tended to, and both turned their attention to Robert. He carried a dry set of clothing in the saddlebag slung over his shoulder, and the ladies gave him privacy to change. Once he had done so, both Annabella and Hope set about bandaging his hands, which were indeed rather raw and painful. Annabella smiled at the way that Hope tutted over the state of them, liking the easy, familiar way they had with each other. I apologise, Miss Kelly, that I cannot offer you my hand in greeting, Robert said with a rueful smile. Annabella waved him away and went to fetch them some dinner. As she was upstairs, her mother called out to her, and Annabella froze. Yes, Mamma, she replied, poking her head into her mother's room. What was all that commotion downstairs? she demanded, her brow furrowed. And do not try to tell me it was a loose shutter or anything of the like because I know better. It's, it was someone in need, Annabella said after a moment's hesitation. Mrs Kelly just stared for a moment and then her face softened. Well, I hope that someone isn't dirtying up our fabric stores and she'll be gone by morning. Annabella smiled and resumed her errand. More than likely, her mother thought it was young Ned bunking for the night. Annabella returned to find that both Hope and Annabella were dozing lightly. Their heads leaned gently against each other as they slumped right on the floor. Annabella hated to wake them, thinking that they looked nothing so much like a pair of children in a way. She couldn't help but feel like she was caught in some sort of fairy story as she watched them sleeping. She only hoped this would... Chapter 12 When Robert awoke, his eyes felt bleary and gritty. He blinked fiercely, trying to clear his vision. Confusion was his first reaction, as he was surrounded by bolts and stacks and crates of fabric in a multitude of colours. Remembering was a few moments in coming, but it was aided by the sore and stiff state of his body. He winced as he tried to move and stretch, having fallen asleep seated on the floor, his back against some shelves. There was a slight snuffling, snoring sound as he attempted to shift about and he became acutely aware of a weight on his shoulder. It was Hope, her head nestled against his. Despite his pain and discomfort, he couldn't help but smile at the sight. Her face, what little he could see of it, was soft and serene, her hair loose about her in a riot of curls. She breathed deeply and evenly, still in Morpheus's embrace. Looking about, he spotted Miss Kelly, the plucky little daughter of the modiste, whose shop they were currently ensconced. She was seated up on a stool at the work table, her head propped up by one hand, but she was busy, snoring lightly, her eyes closed. Robert smiled at her too, knowing that he would forever entertain the tenderest feelings of friendship for her. With a start, Miss Kelly snorted awake, her head nearly falling from its perch atop her hand. Blearily she looked about and then spotted Robert watching her. With a little smile he tilted his head toward Hope, still slumbering, and Miss Kelly smiled shyly. As delicately as she could she extracted herself from her stool and disappeared for a moment. When she reappeared she was carrying an embroidered cushion. With some careful manoeuvring, they managed to slip it between Hope and Robert's shoulder, then gently lowered her to the floor. Robert, thus freed, stood and stretched thoroughly, wincing a little as he did so. He flexed his hands, wrapped in strips of crisp white linen. 
Annabella silently beckoned him toward the back door and spoke in low tones. Have you any plan? she whispered. You cannot linger too long. Mama will be awake before you know it. Robert nodded, feeling a pang of guilt. They had put this poor girl in quite the fix. Should she be found it, it would harm her and the reputation of their store immensely. I am hoping to catch the stage to Scotland as soon as we can. I know that one departs from London regularly. Annabella thought for a moment, then nodded slowly. To Gretna Green? Yes, that is our likely destination, Robert agreed. I must find the coachman's depot, though, if you know the way. I do. But I would not advise it in your present condition, Annabella said with a nod to Robert's hands. One hears the most dreadful tales of men being press-ganged out there. What do you suggest, then? I have a friend that can help, I think, Annabella said slowly. You and Hope must stay here and stay as quiet as you can. If Mama comes down, tell her. Tell her Miss Wycliffe is here for a fitting, I suppose. Will she buy that? Robert asked sceptically. Oh, definitely not, but it will have a whiff of respectability about it. Robert stifled a chuckle. I can see why Hope is so taken with you. And I you, Annabella said with a level look. Robert flushed under the praise, and the girl donned a cloak and was off, softly closing the door behind her. In the corner, Hope still snuffled lightly, somewhat underscoring the seriousness of the scene. As gently as he could, and grimacing a bit from the pain, Robert knelt beside Hope and gently pushed some hair from her forehead. The slight movement roused her, and her eyes fluttered open. A slow, dreamy smile lit up her face. Her features softened from sleep. For Robert, it was a moment of exquisite pain, as he had two realisations. The first was that he was not, and could never be, a poet, not truly, for he couldn't find the words to describe the feeling in this moment. He was aware that he was staring, but he could not look away from her. His words all felt unworthy to express the gentle, pure beauty of her face. The second realisation was that he was so very in love with Hope that he did not care a fig about his aching legs, his stinging hands, nor the bone tiredness that dogged his every movement. He knew, crouched in the back room of a modiste's shop, that he had made the right decision. Good morning, Robert, Hope murmured, her voice sleep thickened. Good morning, Hope he replied automatically. She yawned again, then sat up, looking about. Where has Annabella gone? She went to secure help in getting us on a northbound stagecoach, Robert said, settled back down beside her with a grateful sigh. She's a very kind girl, Hope said, smiling. Her face took on a slightly alarmed mien, then as she looked about again. We have been left alone, she said slowly. Well, there is the end to my reputation, she said with a sad little chuckle. Technically, Mrs Kelly is still in residence upstairs, Robert offered. Hope gave him a baleful look, but she did not seem in earnest. In fact, she laid her head gently upon Robert's shoulder again. I do not mind, she exhaled. I shall be a married woman within the week, and that's the end of that. Besides, no one else will have me now. You are stuck, Mr. Banfield. And very glad of it, Miss Wycliffe, Robert returned softly, laying his head atop hers. He frowned a little as a thought occurred to him. I hope your maid doesn't betray us. I paid her enough to keep quiet, Hope replied. I imagine that will buy us a few hours at least. You bribed your maid, Robert asked, a little disbelieving. The ostler gave me a bargain on gunpowder because I have been writing him poetry to give to your maid. Hope started upright, dislodging Robert's head, whipping around to stare at him. You have been writing poetry for the ostler to give to my maid, she repeated slowly. My maid is being secretly courted by the horse dealer, and you paid with your pen to ensure his silence too. He asks for more poetry for her, 
Robert said a little meekly. I promised him more if he kept quiet. Hope stared into Robert's face for long moments, and Robert wasn't sure if she was offended or not. To his relief, she threw her head back and laughed, then quickly clapped her hands over her mouth when she realised they still had to be secretive. There was no denying the mirth in her eyes, however, and soon Robert had joined her helplessly. And to think I believed ours to be the only secret romance in the county, she sighed. Robert smiled again and gathered hope close. Serenity was not a word typically associated with mornings in the Wycliffe household. There was usually a grand to-do about breakfast, and then all the children had to be herded like so many errant geese either into the nursery or the schoolroom. Mrs Wycliffe was of the habit of breakfasting in her room, as was the right of married women. She found it a necessary few minutes of quiet to steel herself for the day ahead. Unfortunately, this was not possible this morning. There were calls to be made, and she had to have words with Monsieur Piaf regarding the wedding menu. To top it all off, Lord Tilney had threatened to look in, and it would not do to still be abed when he arrived. Mrs Wycliffe did, however, have the good sense to come down after the children had been shepherded off, favouring them as they passed with affectionate pats on the head. She sat at the breakfast table in a cloud of satin and fatigue. A sigh was the first thing from her lips, which earned a look from her husband over his newspaper. Are you well, my dear? he asked lightly. Oh, it's just so wearying, she sighed, motioning to one of the footmen to fill her coffee coupe. Oh, Mr Wycliffe asked faintly. His forehead poked from over the top of the newspaper, just enough that Mrs Wycliffe could see it wrinkling with concern. No doubt he thinks that I am expecting again, Mrs Wycliffe thought wryly. Planning a wedding for one's daughter, she said with a wave of her head. Mr Wycliffe's forehead smoothed instantly. Yes, well, I'm sure you have it all in hand. Of course I do, Mrs Wycliffe agreed, lifting a bun to butter it. I imagine it shall be easier for the younger girls, having had practice. Mr Wycliffe only hummed in response, which was about all that could be expected on this particular topic. Did you see Hope off this morning? she asked, before biting into her bun. Ah, currants, how lovely, she thought. She was up rather early. Her maid said that she was away before dawn. Well, we must do without our second carriage then, I suppose. Still, it will be worth it in the end, I expect. Mrs Wycliffe mused, selecting a slice of cold ham from the platter. Even if Great Aunt Hortensia is a hideous old crone, Mr Wycliffe commented from behind his newspaper. Have you seen this? They say the king is unwell. Honestly, George, you shouldn't speak that way about your poor great aunt. She's no one to look after her any more, Mrs Wycliffe clucked. She's your great aunt, not mine, Mr Wycliffe retorted. Mrs. Wycliffe slowly put her knife down as that comment registered. George, she said slowly, speaking up a bit to make sure that he heard, I do not have a great aunt Hortensia. Well, I certainly don't either, Mr. Wycliffe protested, as if being in possession of a great aunt Hortensia was a sort of insult. Mrs. Wycliffe tapped her fork against her plate lightly, her jaw working. She could pinpoint the exact moment that understanding dawned on Mr. Wycliffe, because a series of events that occurred thusly. First, his forehead could be seen wrinkling again. Next, the newspaper fell a little so that he might look fully at his wife. And then he turned red, then white, in quick order. What are you, what are you saying? he asked. It would seem, dear husband, that our daughter has run off. Mrs Wycliffe said, her voice rising to a pitch usually reserved for boiling tea kettles. Chapter 13 The vicar pushed his spectacles back up his long Roman nose and frowned down at the page he had been writing on. He was having a hard time with the words, and his quill hovered above the page. I ought to ask Robert, he thought begrudgingly. 
He had never had the good relationship that his son had with the written word. It was a struggle to write each week's sermon. He sighed and sat up straight, rubbing with one hand at the crick that had formed in his neck. The windows of his study were leaded glass that was installed the century before, and sometimes the lead joints leaked a little. He was fond of this room nonetheless and kept it as his study because the windows faced the small road that led to the church and the rectory. This lookout was necessary, as most of the people coming to the rectory were on foot. There were very few in the village that could travel by carriage. Some of the people who lived in Shropsborough proper would rent a horse from the ostler to pull a trap or such, but they were so close that it wasn't worth the expense to simply drive to the church. Therefore it was something of a surprise when Vicar Bainfield heard the distinct sound of a carriage pulled by multiple horses coming down the road. So great was his curiosity that he, as induced to lean forward, pressing his nose against the glass. The carriage was coming down at a rather alarming rate of speed, trailing clouds of dust behind it. The vicar frowned, then stood and headed to the door. The housekeeper intercepted him, greatly agitated, and informed him of the imminent arrival. Yes, yes, the vicar said a little impatiently. Go and put the kettle on. Whatever is the matter, it shall certainly require a great deal of tea. By the time the vicar opened the front door of the rectory, the carriage had pulled to a stop, the horses heaving and lathered from the quick pace. Without waiting for a footman, the door to the carriage was flung open and Mr Wycliffe emerged. Reverend, he called, shielding his eyes with one hand and reaching into the carriage with the other. Mrs Wycliffe emerged soon after, blinking and holding a handkerchief to her mouth. Mr Wycliffe, the vicar asked, stepping forward a little, I hope nothing is amiss. A great many things are amiss, Mrs Wycliffe snapped, vinegar in her voice. It is imperative that we speak privately, immediately. The vicar was a little taken aback by this, especially when Mrs Wycliffe bustled right past him into the rectory without so much as a by your leave. Mr Wycliffe followed and made grim eye contact with the vicar. Please do come in, the vicar said belatedly, and closed the door behind everyone. He gestured to the small sitting room, and Mrs Wycliffe immediately sat dramatically upon a simple chair near the fireplace. Allow me to come straight to it, Mrs Wycliffe said. We are in the most dire of situations and require your absolute discretion on the matter. Madam, the vicar said, placing a hand over his heart. You may rest assured that I have always taken the greatest care of confidentiality. Oh, Mary, really, Mr Wycliffe said, exasperated. Turning to the vicar, he said, It would seem that hope has run away. Run away, the vicar repeated. Hope? Surely not, she is such a good girl. What's more? Mrs Wycliffe said slowly, we have reason to believe that she intends to elope with a young man. Elope? the vicar said, looking from one to the other. But she was so soon to be married, she was so dedicated in her attentions to... So we all thought, Mrs Wycliffe interrupted. The facts are these. She departed yesterday morning before dawn. Our carriage is still at home, so she presumably travelled by other means. Her maid, after some... Mrs Wycliffe paused delicately. Forceful questioning, confessed that she believed that Hope may have had a gentleman friend. I can't believe that, the vicar said, shaking his head a little. She's always been such a modest, good... And then, Mrs Wycliffe continued as if the vicar hadn't spoken at all. We find that she has left her engagement ring behind. It also seems that she has been receiving correspondence unbeknownst to us. Correspondence, the vicar repeated. A letter of a strange nature from the daughter of a London modiste, who assures her that she would be delighted to receive her at Hope's earliest convenience. More importantly, however, is that she has also been receiving unsigned letters with poetry and dandelions in them. Mrs Wycliffe fixed the vicar with a glare like daggers. Now whom do we know that might send her poetry and dandelions, hmm? Positively bohemian. 
The vicar looked from Mrs. Wycliffe to Mr. Wycliffe and back again. Surely, surely you cannot think that Robert would disrupt a marriage like this. Reverend, I am not one for casting aspersions, Mr. Wycliffe said carefully. But I have heard that your boy has been spending a deal of time with the ostler of late. More importantly, he... When is the last time you've seen him? Mrs. Wycliffe interrupted. The vicar blinked furiously, thinking, Well, it has been a day or two, I'll allow, but that's not so unusual for... Yes, yes, he is prone to his rambles, Mrs. Wycliffe interrupted. He has been treated most permissively by both of you, she said, turning scathing looks upon her husband and the vicar alike. And now look where this has gotten us. He has absconded with our daughter. She punctuated this last statement with a well-timed sob into her handkerchief. The vicar rocked back on his heels, feeling blindly behind him for a stool on which he sat heavily. The weight of it all was crashing down on him. Oh, Robert, he murmured. I don't think that's fair, Mr Wycliffe protested quietly. Hope has ever led that boy around by the nose. And now she's ruined! Mrs. Wycliffe cried savagely. Not just her, but her sisters too. None of them shall marry now. Oh, just think on it. Mr. Wycliffe let his wife cry and sniffle for a moment, closing his eyes briefly. The vicar watched mutely, feeling very old and helpless all of a sudden. It doesn't matter who is at fault here, Mr. Wycliffe said pragmatically. What matters is that we work to recover them and attempt to mitigate this disaster. Write to Lord Tilney, tell him to get a special licence at once, Mrs Wycliffe said, looking up with red-rimmed eyes. If they are married before he can hear, before anyone hears... That's rather deceptive, don't you think? the vicar asked, and immediately regretted speaking up. Deceptive? Mrs Wycliffe whispered near hysterics. This whole tawdry affair has been one deception after another. I'm trying to save the reputation of a most beloved daughter before she is ruined and shunned for her whole life. I think it's best we make the best of a bad situation, Mr Wycliffe said, placing a hand on his wife's shoulder. We shall need you to marry them immediately, Reverend, when we find them. You are going after them then? the vicar asked. Mr Wycliffe nodded. Aye. We're setting off at once. We've arranged changes of horse so that we don't have to stop. We'll be in London by evening. I will come with you, the vicar said, rising on wobbling knees. It seems the least I can do. Mr Wycliffe nodded. I have sent a message to Lord Tilney, asking him to meet us in London. We will tell him that we will be travelling urgently, and thus they must be married as soon as possible. I... yes the vicar said. I suppose that is for the best. Though he said it doubt plagued the vicar. He was a man of complete faith, so it was an unusual sensation for him. He wondered if any of this was for the best. Despite the fact that they had to hide in a small workroom, Hope couldn't recall a time when she had been happier. Though it had only been two days, it felt like she and Robert had always existed thusly. They had even once greatly daring, ventured out to procure their own dinner. It was the evening of the third night when Annabella revealed the rest of the plan. She had been accompanied by a grubby boy called Ned, who seemed all too happy to do Annabella's bidding. The boy would arrange for Robert to sell his horse and saddle and buy their places on the stage bound for Scotland. Annabella had to tend to her mother, so Robert and Hope were left alone to eat the pies they bought from a nearby vendor in peace. They did not say much, but smiled at each other across the work table. Have you considered where we might go? Hope asked, and Robert tilted his head at the question. I mean, afterward. I thought, well, if you would not mind too much, Robert began, unexpectedly shy, we could stay in Scotland or... Well, I thought we might go to America. America? Hope asked, putting her pie back down on the brown paper it had come wrapped in. Or Canada, Robert added hurriedly. I've heard that they have such new ideas there. We might start a new life. America, Hope repeated. She looked down at her pie, considering. 
She could practically feel Robert fretting in the silent space between her words. That sounds like an awfully grand adventure. Let us go there and live in the wild frontier together, Hope said, breaking into a grin. Robert answered her grin with a smile of his own, exhaling in relief. I should have known you would approve. You always were a better adventurer than me. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching. No such thing, Hope protested. You were the one who snuck into Farmer Brown's strawberry patch when we were eight. You swung higher than anybody on the swing in the garden, Robert countered, and you walked all the way to the next village simply because you felt like it at ten years. Hope laughed softly. Yes, but you were the only who was brave enough to whisk me away from... all of that unpleasantness, she said gently. Robert blushed and looked down at his hands. He opened his mouth to say something else, but was interrupted by the sound of hooves in the alley behind the shop. That must be Ned, he said, quickly wrapping the rest of his pie and stuffing it into his coat pocket. They had already dressed in preparation for a quick departure at a moment's notice. Hope was back in her warm and comfortable riding habit. He said that he could arrange transportation to the stage depot. It's time then, Hope said, feeling an unexpected flip in her stomach. Robert smiled at her and held out his hand. She took it gladly and was gazing at him adoringly when he opened the back door. Unfortunately, it was very, very much not Ned that awaited them. To her shock and dismay, it was an all-too-familiar coach that awaited. From within the coach, Hope could see familiar faces all lined up and glaring. Her parents, the vicar and... Lord Tilney, she gasped, reflexively clutching at Robert's hand tighter. Sir, Mr Wycliffe began, stepping down from the carriage, I demand that you release my daughter at once. Hope, Robert said in a surprisingly clear and sure voice. Do you wish to go with your parents? I shan't stop you if that is your wish. Hope did not answer with words, opting instead to slam the door shut and bolt it. Robert blinked at the suddenness of it all, but recovered quickly. Right, he said. There's nothing for it. We must make a run for the stage depot. That's halfway across London, Hope protested. But she was already picking up the train of her skirt and throwing it over her arm. We must try. Robert said simply. And with that, they were out the front door of the shop, holding tightly to each other's hands, running with a kind of wild ab Chapter 14 Robert was a young man accustomed to being out of doors, having a great fondness for long walks and ambling about the countryside. Hope, too, was a woman of athletic persuasion, spending a great deal of time walking and riding, too. So it was, that they were able to make quite good headway, owing no small amount of their success to the sheer surprise of simply dashing away. Also to their advantage was that they were on foot rather than in a bulky carriage pulled by four horses. The streets of London narrowed and twisted, sometimes with sharp corners and little alleys that could be cut through. Therefore, they were able to lose their pursuers easily, at least for a time. Unfortunately for the young lovers, however, was that London was a large city, and even their endurance soon flagged. The shadows were lengthening, showing that afternoon was stretching into evening. It was doubtful that they would reach the stage depot in time for a departure this evening. They would have to find a safe haven before long. Robert halted them, releasing Hope's hand to place his own on his knees and inhale in great gulps. They were sheltered in a shallow alley, with the houses leaning over them, nearly blocking out the light. Hope sagged against the brick wall, one hand pressed to her stomach as she fought for air. Robert felt an immense tide of guilt wash over him. Hope, he said, still a little breathless. Please forgive me. This isn't what I wanted for you. None of this is. There is still time if you wish to turn back and... Hope silenced him with two fingers pressed to his lips. No, 
I shall never look back. You are worth any trial. In spite of his exhaustion, Robert smiled, seized Hope's hand and pressed a kiss to it. From behind them, over his shoulder, a voice cried out, Hope! Wait! Please! Hope! Hope groaned and pushed herself off the wall and Robert followed suit. We have to find somewhere to take sanctuary, even for a little bit, she said, taking deep, steadying breaths. Robert's mind raced. Sanctuary, he thought slowly. He stepped back from the alley for just a moment, his eyes scanning the London skyline. A shining dome, stark white against the sky, gleamed proudly in the sun. I have an idea, he said. Can you run just a bit farther? Hope grimaced but nodded determinedly. Robert took her hand and off they went. They wended their way through the streets, goaded by someone occasionally calling their names. Every time they heard the clatter of carriage wheels on the cobbled streets, both would redouble their efforts, persisting from sheer determination. At last, as evening was well and truly falling about them, they reached the striking edifice of St Paul's Cathedral. It still had the gleam of newness about it, having been completed only a few decades before. In spite of the urgency of their situation, Robert could not help but gaze up for a moment. From the corner of his eye, he could see that Hope was similarly in awe. I've never seen anything like it, she breathed. It's very much, Robert agreed. Come, we should find a way in. Services must be done for the day. How? Hope asked, leaning a bit against the fence. Taking a chance, Robert pushed at the gate, which gave way. Supporting Hope, they crossed the paved stones and entered the cathedral through a side door, opening it only just enough to pass. Once within, everything was hushed and dark. The sound of their ragged breathing echoed about. Beyond all thought of propriety, Hope leaned her back against one of the massive pillars within and slid to the marble floor. Robert was inclined to join her, placing an arm about her to try and ward off any coming chill. Well, Hope said, it's a little literal for what I meant when I said sanctuary, but I suppose it will do. It's lovely within, Robert said, his head tilted back to behold the ceiling, the stained glass, all of it. The gloom within was growing as the sky outside darkened, but the beauty was not diminished. It makes me wonder... Hope, clearly exhausted, let her head loll over to look at him. What does it make you wonder? Well, perhaps the grandness of it isn't the point of the cathedral. Maybe it's the dedication of the workers to have made such a thing. They must have felt inspired to create something like this, Robert said thoughtfully. I've always felt the same way, a voice said from the dark behind them. Robert was instantly on his feet springing upright and whirling to face whoever had spoken. Hope, too, had likewise leapt to her feet, but she ducked behind Robert a little, clutching his arm and shoulder. He peered into the dark, seeing only a vaguely white shape. Who goes there? he demanded. Peace, children, the voice said gently. From the gloom stepped a tall, stately man in white and crimson vestments. Oh, Robert said. Forgive us, Your Grace. I... that is, we... well, it's... he stammered. Having grown up with a vicar for a father, he recognised a bishop's robes when he saw them. Please, Your Grace, Hope said, emerging from behind Robert's shoulder. We come seeking sanctuary. The bishop smiled gently and gestured to a bench along the wall, indicating they might sit. Yes, I imagined that to be so. Tell me, who pursues you so? Over the course of the next hour, Robert and Hope spun their tale for the bishop, who listened attentively. Occasionally he nodded, asking a question here and there, but by and large he simply listened. Well, I have seen enough determined young people to know more than to try to convince you to a different course of action, he said at last. I presume you shall be departing London shortly then. Before Robert could answer, 
There was another clatter as the side door was forced open again. Instinctually, Robert stood, placing himself before Hope. He sighed a little sigh of relief when he saw that it was only Annabella, looking bedraggled and exhausted. I have been trying to catch up with you for the past hour, she gasped, one hand on a convenient pillar, the other on her stomach as she tried to catch her breath. I had no notion you country types were such adept runners. Hope laughed weakly and held out her hands to Annabella. You are a sight for sore eyes, she said tiredly. Robert too smiled and took one of Annabella's hands. Their happy reunion was short-lived, however, for there was a general cacophony of feet, angry voices and rustling skirts directly on Annabella's heels. You see, Mrs Wycliffe cried triumphantly, her voice echoing shrilly within the nave. I told you that little minx would lead us to them. Robert only stared open-mouthed for a moment, not believing that they had been cornered, and so quickly. He shot a glance at the bishop, ready to apologise for the irreverent intrusion. He found, however, that the bishop was watching all of this unfold with a somewhat bemused expression. He placed one hand comfortingly on Hope's hands. Satisfied that Hope was suitably protected, he turned back to face the assembled. Mr and Mrs Wycliffe, his father and a pointy-nosed stranger, he could only assume was Lord Tilney. I am sorry that we worried all of you so, he began. Robert, how could you? his father asked, coming forward, his eyes shining in the light of a lantern held aloft by a footman who was doing his level best to not look like he was eavesdropping. That girl was betrothed, a most sacred state of affairs. There was nothing sacred about it, a small voice piped up. As one, the entire crowd swivelled to face Annabella. The girl was slender and looked as if a stern wind might blow her over, but she stood straight and proud as she stared at all of them. With a glance to the bishop, who nodded in encouragement, Annabella rounded on everyone. Mama says that God's most sacred commandment was to love each other. He loved us enough to give all of us his only son. I don't think he would be best pleased to see his children being treated thusly. Don't you try to... Mrs Wycliffe began, but was silenced by a hand on her arm from Mr Wycliffe. Just look at them, Annabella said, indicating with a sweep of her arm the sorry state that Hope and Robert found themselves in. Self-consciously, Robert pulled at his jacket and shuffled his feet. Look at the misery put themselves through just to be together. How can you belittle them or their commitment so? From the mouths of babes, the bishop said softly, smiling. Your Grace, Vicar Banfield said, shocked, clearly not having registered who was sitting beside Hope. He dipped his head in acknowledgement, seemingly caught between bowing and offering his hand in greeting. For my part, I want none of this, Lord Tilney announced. The girl has been alone with this upstart for however long. I'll not be party to it. Consider the engagement dissolved. But, 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 Mrs Wycliffe stammered, but could only watch as the erstwhile marriage prospect made his exit. Oh, come now, we cannot allow this. How will they live? she demanded. We are going to emigrate, Hope said, tossing her head. We wish to go to America, so there will be a minimum of embarrassment for all involved. But how will he support you? Mr Wycliffe asked simply, spreading his hands wide. His devotion to you is not in question, dear girl, merely his ability to provide. If I may, the bishop said, standing and coming forward, it occurs to me that there is an elegant solution for all of this. Please, Your Grace, continue, the vicar said. Robert nodded, gesturing openly. My son, you speak so eloquently on matters of your fellow man and your desire to serve them. The church can be a means of doing this, the bishop said, placing a hand on Robert's shoulder. I have no desire to rail against the frailties of men's hearts from the pulpit, Robert said firmly. There is more than one way to speak God's words, the bishop said. There is a cry from small towns, communities of miners and weavers, 
men and women whose lives are about to be upended in the coming century. I consider it a duty to stay abreast of the news, and this craze for machinery will need them more in need of protection than ever. What say you? he said, taking Robert by both shoulders and looking directly into his eyes. Will you be their shepherd? They will need someone to speak on their behalf, to be their champion and their comfort. Robert blinked in response, feeling stunned. It was everything he wished to do to be. I... I can do all of that if I take the cloth. The bishop smiled, shaking Robert slightly as he spoke. Much more than just being a man on his own. Robert smiled in return and the bishop gently turned him round to face his father. Now make peace with your father. Robert, exhausted by elated, impulsively threw his arms about his father, who was taken aback by the suddenness. They parted long enough to grin at each other, and the vicar held his hand out to Hope, who rose and came forward to accept it. I shall be very glad to have you for a daughter, the vicar said. Robert thought his heart might break from happiness, and he swept Hope up impulsively, twirling her about, her feet dangling above the floor. But a vicar! Mrs. Wycliffe protested weakly. Take cheer, my dear, Mr. Wycliffe said, taking her hand and patting it. All the best families have one. Robert could hear his father agreeing and was dimly amused at his satisfaction. The majority of his attention, however, was fixed on hope. He still held her tightly, his arms wrapped about her waist. Her large blue eyes stared directly into his. So full and sparkling, he thought he might fall into them. Impulsively and with more daring than he had ever shown in his life, Robert pressed his lips to hers, kissing her with all of the fervour and love he could summon. She gasped a little in surprise, but happily threw her arms about his neck and returned the kiss. He could feel her lips smiling against his, and he thought he might die from happiness in that moment. Oh, really? This is a house of the Lord, the vicar objected. Not to worry, the bishop said, sounding amused. I Epilogue The bell above the shop door tinkled merrily as it was pushed open. Annabella, putting the finishing stitches on a pair of gloves, looked up and smiled when she saw that it was Ned, the postboy. He was attempting to rummage in his sturdy leather post bag and walk at the same time. Consequently, he bumped into a mannequin, nearly upsetting it. Beg pardon, Mum, he muttered, not looking up. Have you something for us? Annabella asked. Yes, Miss, Ned said, brow wrinkled and tongue poking out a little as he dug about. Here it is, he announced triumphantly, brandishing the letter. Give your ma my regards, Ned said as he handed it over. Annabella hid a wince as Ned said that. Her mother had taken to bed again, and this time the cough was deep and unrelenting. She minded the shop on her own most days now. Her mother was too unwell to make it down the stairs most days. I will, she said softly. The postboy grinned his gap-toothed grin, touched his hat and was off to make more deliveries. Annabella sighed, then looked down at the letter in her hands. The script was familiar, but she did not recognise the direction. She lifted the seal and unfolded it, her eyes scanning the words quickly. Instantly, a grin spread on her face. My darling, dear, sweet Annabella, I must begin with an apology for not writing sooner. It has been too long since I have done so, but I had hoped to deliver this news in person. Unfortunately, events have conspired against me, and I don't know when I might be in London again. As it happens, Robert has completed seminary. He made such a favourable impression that he was immediately offered a living far to the north. Apparently there is some trouble with some weavers there, and they hope that he might be able to calm them. He is so very eager to begin his work that we departed immediately. Of course, this completely upset Mother's plans for a grandiose wedding, which is exactly as we wish it. Robert's father married us beneath our favourite tree on a sunny afternoon, and I couldn't have wished for anything better. 
I wore those beautiful embroidered gloves you sent me, so it felt as if a part of you was with me. Oh, Annabella, it was such a lovely day. There were butterflies all about, and it was more beautiful than if I had been wed in a palace. Please take all of our love and embraces, and give our best to your mother. I know she was rather put out by the whole business, but I suspect that she will be mollified by a good story. I have faith you will be able to spin it accordingly. Your dedicated friend, Hope Banfield P.S. I cannot describe the pleasure I take in signing my name. A wave of sentiment came over Annabella. She sighed heavily, thinking wistfully of such a romance as her friend had lived. She was right, of course, Mrs Kelly would be cheered considerably by this news. After all, she was ever so fond of a happy ending. The end. Read Annabella's story now. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.